What's up everyone? Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Oil & Whiskey. Before we kick things off, I wanna let you know that very soon at oilandwhiskey.com, you will be able to get the best merchandise for all things Oil & Whiskey, and there might be some incredible collaborations along the way. Everyone here at Ironclad is so excited to launch things with the guys at the Roadster Shop. Check it out, coming soon, oilandwhiskey.com for the best apparel and collaborations. There's a lot of cool people in the world and most of them aren't famous. Yeah. <laughs> right? Most, people, yeah. most of the cool people I know are not famous. Yeah. And some of my favorite people to talk to are not famous. And some of them, unfortunately, I've made famous. But uh, <laughs> it's fucking weird for them, man. It's some, it, I've had some weird moments where I, I, I had this unknown person on the show, and then I have them on, then I'll get a text message. My whole life just changed. Like, this is nuts, man. My phone won't stop ringing. I'm getting emails from people I went to high school with. Like, this is nuts, man. Welcome to Oil & Whiskey, an ironclad original. I am Josh Henning. I'm Phil Gerber. I'm Jeremy Gerber. Generally, this is about the time where we do some long, elaborate, uh, you know, read about the guest and all their accolades but honestly we say on a few of them that this guy doesn't need any introduction and then i still do an introduction yeah. but this one legitimately needs no introduction <laughs> joe rogan welcome to oil and whiskey welcome dude hey what's happening not too much what's man. going on man nothing just chilling talking to you guys sweet dude you have uh you've been quite the busy man over the last year year and a half building an actual mothership yeah uh we <laughs> We uh, have launched a month ago, so it's been open for a month now. Uh, the Comedy Mothership in Austin. That's awesome. Pretty awesome. I know we, you know, a couple of years ago when we were talking, you were, you had that vision, that idea. You were looking at property. You had some ideas, and so that's really cool to see it come to fruition. I'm sure that had its uh, challenges and hurdles to get uh, everything to come to fruition. Yeah, it's not easy. You know, it's I never wanted to open up a comedy club, and I always told all the comedians, be nice to comedy club owners. Because you don't want to be one of those fucking people. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work, man. It's a lot of work, and you're dealing with comedians, and they're all crazy. But uh, once I moved to Austin, I was like, God damn it, I think I have to open one of my own. And so uh, I figured, all right, let's do it. Well, being at the comedy store for so long and the ins and outs, and, uh, I mean, that being your life for so long, what did you do? What did you know you were going to do the same, and what did you know you were going to do absolutely fucking different? Well, I knew I was going to make it similar to the comedy store in that it sort of um, facilitates this feeling of camaraderie and uh, gives comedians like a home base to hang out in and has a lot of open mic nights. We have two nights of open mic nights and uh, we hired uh, all the door staff and people that work there are all comedians. So the door staff is all people that are struggling comedians that are trying to make it and so it's a, a giant opportunity for them to be around some of the best comedians in the world to see guys like Dave Chappelle and Tom Segura and Shane Gillis and all these guys go on stage and also to just be in that environment and see how these people inter see how these comics interact with each other and hang out with each other and watch them do sets over and over and over again it's very beneficial for the development of new talent which is really important for a real comedy club like you can't just have people come in from other other places that are already big names you have to develop new local talent so that was part of the idea of building this comedy club was not just to have a place where big names can go but also a place where the young up-and-coming people can develop you gotta make them run the gauntlet like everybody else had to do back in the day it's not really a gauntlet <laughs> i mean look it's a gauntlet doing stand-up stand-up <laughs> sucks like it's hard in the beginning. It's it's rough. It's very very difficult to do. And so that's the gauntlet. The gauntlet is getting on stage. The gauntlet is. I mean, they're all doing terrible rooms. Also, they're all doing these little shitty bar shows, and they're doing little clubs here and there, doing the road. But to have a beautiful, really well designed home club where you know they can just everything is perfect. The setup's perfect. The sounds perfect. The way it's all. The way the audience is seated, there's a whole tunnel system so that when you come into the club, you go, you are, you're actually in a tunnel when you get into the uh, back entrance where you go underneath the audience to get to the green room. 
So you're separated from the audience. So people don't bother you before you go on stage. It's pretty sweet. Dude, that's, that's a clever spin on it for giving guys the opportunity. We try to do the same thing here. When you bring, you got a guy that's like an aspiring fabricator, hire him. You can sweep the floors. Dude, you're hanging around all the best in the business, but that usually lasts like a week of sweeping the floors. And then he's like, I want to raise and I want to be doing what that guy's doing. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta show us. You are can you do running, that. are you running into that yet? They're like, all right, well, thanks. Working the door has been cool, but now I want to do what Dave Chappelle's doing. No, or they're, they're, they're pretty understanding. Then you just throw them up after Dave Chappelle and watch him eat dick. <laughs> you, know, like, like you can't pretend you're anything other than what you are in comedy. Yeah. You know, there's no, I'm, uh, I need my shot. I'm better. Like there's no, no, no. Everybody's seeing you go on stage. So you'll have your chance. You'll have your opportunity. Everybody will get their stage time and not just here. One of the beautiful things about Austin right now is uh, once I moved here, my mission was, I had two missions, open up a comedy club and then recruit the best comedians in the world to come to Austin. And so far, I've got 12 world-class comedians living here now. I mean, this is absolutely, Austin, Texas is the hub of the comedy world right now, without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, we got sick. Tim Dillon, Tom Segura, Tony Hinchcliffe. I mean, we have so Ron White is here. Um, I mean, and so many guys are thinking about moving here. I'm just actively trying to get these guys here. Austin is a fucking great town. The people are cool as hell. Food's amazing. It's a great live music scene. It's just a great place to live. And for comedians, like, we've always been attached to Hollywood. You know, ever right. like that's the carrot they always dangle in front of you. It's always like, you know, hey, if you play your cards right, you can wind up on TV. And, I, and I'm like, fuck TV. Like, I did it, man. I'm telling you. Podcasts and stand-up comedy is way better. That's where it's at. And that's that's really what everybody loves to do. And so what I want to do is give people the opportunity where they can come here. And, you know, Tom Segura is here, too. So your mom's house podcast is here. And they also do uh, Two Bears, One Cave here with yeah. Bert Kreischer. So it's crazy how in just three years... The comedy world has just flipped on its head. Yeah, you started a hell of a movement there. That's man. fucking nuts. It's, it's the fucking place to be. Who's no playing? Who's well, playing uh, the role of of Polly Shore's mom there now? Nah, I guess that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm Mitzi. You know, so it's just, uh, hey man, is that my car over your right shoulder? Is that my yeah, Chevrolet? It, it, it sure is. is. Hell yeah! <laughs> the whole God, fuck, the whole damn, fucking I love wall. That car. <laughs> yeah, the whole oh, fucking I love wall. that car so much. Well, Every you... time I get in that car, I sit it in, I just touch the steering wheel, look around, and rub the dash. <laughs> Are you able to get out and drive when it? When I was a kid, oh, I drive it all the time. Man. I nice. drive that car all the time. When I was 16 years old, um, a buddy of mine picked me up, and his, his friend was driving, and he picked me up in a 1970 Chevelle, black with white stripes, like that. And we drove, and I remember being in this car thinking, how does someone own this? How is it possible that he owns this? It was like so outside of reality to me. I remember just looking at it going, this is the most incredible car I've ever seen. It was cherry. It was so nice. And I, ever since then, I've always wanted one. And I never got one. I never bought one. I bought all these other cars. I had all these other muscle cars. But I never got a 70 Chevelle. I just never found one that I really liked until I saw that video of the one you guys made for Matt. And uh, when when you told me that he was willing to sell it, I was like, "Holy shit, looks good!" Cool. He wasn't like <laughs> really really willing to sell it. <laughs> he was only willing to sell it to one person. <laughs> well, I'm very happy he's willing to sell it to me. I'm indebted to that guy. I, that's one of my favorite cars for sure. I love that car so much. Yeah, we we dig that thing. We actually just kind of kind of sort of duplicated. It. We just finished up another one that's out uh, out on the West Coast now. It's like, it's kind of like that car, but like crazy crazy show quality over the top but sick car man i mean the black and white chevelle doesn't get any fucking bad i was hooked on that it's such a classic it's such a classic oh, yeah. i was hooked on it dazed and confused did it for me you know when i was a kid ah. fucking wooderson and the black and white chevelle dude game changers yeah game changers. yeah like, you wanted to be him didn't you yeah i still kind of do, do. <laughs> you know, I still kinda, it never went away i had to tell mcconaughey i had to tell mcconaughey <laughs> that i had that car i got one of those and uh, he, he loves it so was that, it, that you're saying 16, uh, buddy comes and picks you up. Was that the jumping off point? Was that the turning point in the, like, where it's stuck inside you for the love of muscle cars or, or cars in general? Or was it, were you already into the shit before? I love cars. I've always loved cars, but muscle cars are my thing. You know, other cars are great. Like I have a, a couple of Porsches 
I have a 93 RS America that I really love because it's real raw, no power steering, it's no air conditioning, no radio, not just that, that air cooled. Well, <laughs> I fucking love that thing. But if I had to pick one car, like if I could only have one car, it would 100% be a muscle car. Like there's something for me about like 65. So you can go maybe 71 with the Barracuda. Yeah. And then, then it just goes to shit. It's like, for me, it's like those years. And I don't know what was going on in America where they made such incredible cars. But to this day, I mean, I remember when I was in high school, okay, I went to high school in 81, but I was 14. Those cars were only 10 years old and they were already classics. Yeah. You know, everybody wanted those cars and you could kind of get them, you know, they were, they were available. It wasn't that, they weren't that expensive really, but there was something about that year of car. I guess it's cause like when I was 14, those were the cars Yeah, and all of my buddies that were into cars, everybody was into muscle cars. Like no one was in the like Lamborghinis or Ferraris or anything. It was always American muscle. Yeah. I guess well, you, didn't you, know, really have, you didn't really have a choice back then. Cause there was no import scene. Right, and no. Ferraris and Lamborghinis were crap back then. And right. unaffordable. Or, uh, or yeah. unattainable, yeah. For Right, that was it. Not, yeah. as main, not as mainstream. But even if they were attainable, if you pulled <clears> up <throat> in like a 1970 Challenger and you heard that, blah, 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 all the guys would get around like, oh, shit. There's something about those cars. Like to this day, like if someone pulls up in a Ferrari and I pull up behind them in the Chevelle, I guarantee you more people are going to be looking at the Chevelle. There's oh, yeah. something about those cars. It's just like they're rolling pieces of art. Yeah. It's like American design and engineering. And the, there's nothing like the roar of a V8. There's nothing like it. Well, uh, continuing to be a connoisseur and, you know, study them and understanding the technology and understanding the American, uh, you know, mindset of building stuff like that and how different it is today. But it, 13, 14, we talk to uh, people all the time, and I'm always interested and in, in, intrigued by why do you think that it was cars, specifically muscle cars, that ingrained on you where it was like, was it Wasn't the sound? Bikes, was it because it was fucking awesome looking? Or is it because I'm going to get a bunch of chicks with it? Like, what what do you think, or the fucking freedom of just, you know what, I'm envisioning myself in that car one day just blasting down by myself listening to whatever music. It could be as simple as one little living out one little dream, you know, and that's why you have to have that car, but everybody's a little different. And it's, it's interesting. The stories of why that is the thing that you, it's, sometimes it's seeing somebody that's the coolest what, motherfucker on the block. What, what was it for you? I don't, I don't honestly, I can't. And dude, it's, it's not, it I wasn't, no, if you think it's the chicks, it's not the fucking chicks. Cause no, the car only dudes are into them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You said it yeah, best. Yeah. Chicks dudes think love them. Stink. Yeah. yeah. They hate <laughs> the gas smell. Or, yeah. Oh, what the fuck is wrong with you? My wife to this day, when I take her for a ride in the Chevelle, she's like, oh, it's so noisy. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. I'll stomp on the gas and downshift. <laughs> Larry. Uh, I don't know, man. It's all the above. It's everything. <laughs> it's like when I was, um, I guess I was 15 or 16. I was working at a gas station. And uh, my friend John, uh, his brother Cliff, had a 65 GTO convertible. And uh, his his uh, his license plate said chirps because he would chirp through the gears <laughs> when he'd drive by. It was cherry red. And everybody would just watch him drive by like, oh, oh. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is to this day. But it's everything. It's just like, to me... They're the they 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 signify my favorite era of music, my favorite era of just so many things about American culture. I mean, that's like during the Vietnam War, like all the the cultural shit was popping off in America. The anti-war movement, rock and roll, Jimi Hendrix, it was everything. It's almost like you a know, that, rolling fuck you. Like it's you yeah, know, it's kind of it's it's showing what you are bit. probably into. Everybody wants to have make some type of little bit of statement, whether it's the clothes you wear or the car you drive or whatever, you know, yeah. it's, it's not about what people think, but at the same time, you're also kind of saying, I'm, I'm one of these guys, you know, I like fucking, you know, badass yeah. American muscle cars. I'm with, the, I'm with cars. the cool guys. Yeah. I'm with the cool guys. Oh, go. Well, it's also something when, when, like if, if you are somewhere and some guy pulls up in a 69 Camaro, you all have something to talk about. Like every, everybody wants to go over and talk about it. Like, what do you got? What's, what, what, what is this? What's, what's going on with this thing? And, you know, like the 69 Camaro you guys made to me, that thing is so goddamn nice. 
Oh my God, the way that thing drives and the way it handles. It's so powerful though, dude. Holy shit. That ass kicks out <laughs> oh, yeah. so easy. It but it's so rips. controllable. Those giant fat wide back tires. Woo! Yeah, Woo! Drive with your right that, foot or steer with your right foot. Yeah, that one. Yeah. That one's a fucking Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, that car, that car is magic. The fucking motor in that car that Wagner did. I love. We've done so many different supercharged LS motors. That thing just fucking absolutely rips. It's got like all the power and it's right on the edge of like too much, but it's still controllable. Yeah. Justin, you know, just yeah. enough to pucker right. every time. Yeah. Yeah, you pucker. Yeah. <laughs> First time I drove it, I pucker. I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> yeah, you got to. Yeah, gotta... the Chevelle is more manageable. I think the yeah. Chevelle is what, 600? Yeah, it's mid sixes. Yeah, naturally, as you yeah. got a lot more ramp up into it where the supercharger hits you a lot harder. Yeah. Super right. Charger. Yeah. And then the, the, <clears throat> The Camaro is what eight fifty or something. Yeah, that that thing's preposterous. Yeah, when you get on that sucker, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, going back on a little bit, like you said, on meeting guys, you know, with cars, you've you've had, you've been in a lot of fucking circles in the comedy circles and the Hollywood circles and everything around. Hey, can you pick up a difference in the people that that are for whatever reason into cars, regardless of what type of cars, and those that aren't? I mean, you know, like you said, you've got something to talk about. Again, I'm trying to dig into this. Wonder what it is. Is it a certain type of people that like that? That are into them? And can it's you so can many you notice that? People like Jay Leno and I. Other than our love of stand up comedy, we couldn't be any further from each other. You know, in, in differences. But when I get together with that guy, we could talk cars for days. You know, it's there's something about the engineering, the way they work. It just and. I mean, I guess there's a lot of women that are into him, but for men, there's it's something about those those damn things speak to you. You know, it's hard to describe why. It is. It's like just when I see them, like if 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 I park in a parking lot and some guy's got like a '69 Firebird there, I I just walk over to that thing immediately. I want to look at it. It's like they're they're a magnet. Yeah, they really are. You can't you, know? you can't like justify why almost every car, even the ones I don't really like. You look at them and you're like, you think of the reason why you want to have it. Like a Firebird. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not really like a Firebird guy, but you see a Firebird and you're like, ah, oh, fuck that man, white with like some shit. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of yeah. like to have one yeah. of those. There's just yeah. each one makes you want it for some reason. Fucking Roadrunner, gotta have a Roadrunner. I want one of those. Yeah, it's just, it's amazing to me that nobody's been able. You can't quantify it. You can't put a thing, even vaguely, of being like, you know what most of the guys want the freedom that they think they're going to get by that car or they think they're going to be cool. There is no right. like common thread amongst any car guy of the reason why. And they, they generally always answer the same way. Like, I can't tell you why they're just fucking cool. What was the first one you got your hands on Joe? First muscle car that you actually owned. I bought a 1968 olds four, four, two okay. in, um, 1984. I think. I think I was a sophomore in high school and I wrapped it around a tree. I hydroplaned <laughs> nice. and slammed into a tree. It was not good. It was I had bald tires and it was raining out and I didn't know what I was doing. I was sixteen. How how you soon know? after you got it did you wreck it? Not that long. <laughs> not that long. It was like maybe two months, three months. And then after that I got uh, a cutlass. I got a nineteen seventy cutlass. That was pretty nice. Um, and then I had, um, what did I get after that? I got a 1971 Barracuda. That was my mom's car. My mom sold me her car. Damn. Um, and I had that for a while. And then, um, I went through a period when I was doing stand up comedy. Well, I went through a period when I was fighting and then I was doing stand up comedy while I was just dead broke. And so that period of time from, you know, the time I was like 18 till I was like, 30, I didn't have any money. Why? I, well, but till I was like, I guess I was like 27. And that's when I came to Hollywood. And that's when I got on TV. And then I got a uh, Toyota Supra, a Supra Turbo, uh, which was nice. You know, the one with the big yeah. crazy tail on the yeah, back. And I love that car too. But I was always like, man, I got to get another muscle car. Like there was always like this longing, but they, I felt like they weren't practical. They didn't handle right. And I really couldn't afford more than one car back then. So I was like trying to figure out like what to do. And then I had um, for that show rides. They built me that um, 1970 Cuda, but it, it could it was it was 
beautiful car, but it was terrible to drive. It was everything was there's so many things wrong with it. It was like they made it to look really pretty. It was a really pretty show car. But um I got rid of that car and then uh Reggie Bush, the football player, he bought it and he had it for a while and he did you know, he fixed a few things about it, but it was still it just was it was not well put together. And that I had Steve Strope fix a bunch of things on it. And then um, when uh, Reggie Bush sold it, he sold it back to uh, Fusion Motorsports in L.A. Yeah. And uh, my friend Yoel, who owns it, he said, hey, we got your car back. And just a light bulb went off in my head. I was like, I got to get that car back. <laughs> and uh, I bought it back. And then immediately it was like, I got to send it to Roaster Shop. That was my thought. It's like I knew you guys were doing these fucking incredible cars. I was a big fan. I'd seen a lot of your stuff online. And it was like, I always wanted that car to be a six speed and they talked me out of it and made it an automatic. I hate automatics. I was like, there's something about American muscle cars. You, you got to shift those fucking things. Oh, yeah, I want to feel, I want to hear the, oh, oh, <laughs> like this is half the fun. Man. You got to work like, for it. Like to get the yeah. reward, you got to work for it. You've got to do it. It's yeah. not even work, man. It's a pleasure. Yeah. It's like, there's something about it. It's like, you're so mechanically connected to everything yeah. and so uh when i got that car and i uh, shipped it off to you guys that's that's i'm very very excited about that car and you know the pictures that you guys have shown me holy shit it looks amazing dude that I'm, car in beyond pumped we're just getting ready to get it out on the street and start doing some road tuning that thing was like every single thing we focused on on that is making it work fucking awesome to be like the most bitching car to drive ever and I, I think you're going to be, like I think it. you're going to be fucking stoked. I mean, it looks cool. It originally, the car was built. It always looked fucking awesome. You yeah. Know? Fucking gorgeous car way ahead of its time, but now it should work. Like, as well, I love as it that looks. it's all silver too. You know, when, um, Chip Foose wanted to paint it up like a, like a Spanish hooker, put all these <laughs> like crazy wild colors all over it. And I was like, man, I don't know. I, I saw the painting of it, like where he designed it. I'm like, yeah, that looks pretty cool. But then when they showed it to me all in sheet metal, like a light bulb went off in my head. I was like, no, this thing has to be silver. Yeah. It has to be all silver. They were like battling me on it. And, you know, it got to the point where I was like, hey, guys, shut the fuck up and make it silver. Like, <laughs> if you don't make it silver, I'm going to fucking send it somewhere and make it silver right after you give it to me. Right. So let's just do it. Were you as big as you are now back then? I mean, that may have had a, Int a, a sway an intimidation yeah. factor, you saying? Well, uh, I mean, Big physically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just as big physically, but I don't think they were worried about me beating them up. It's it was just you know people have that's a thing with people like Chip Foose is a brilliant designer. He's got these ideas about cars and he wants them to be show cars and those show cars are all. But I drive all my cars. Yeah. I drive them. I don't have any interest in keeping a car in a garage and staring at it. Like I like to get little rock chips on them and I, I like to drive them. I don't mind if they're dirty. I, I love them. You know, I, I drive them. Well, this one already comes with, like, some door dings and stuff. I don't know if Reggie Bush's wife parked too close to it. <laughs> I, hope they, I, I hope they disclose that when they sold it back to you. But for the most part, the car held up phenomenally well. Like, yeah, it's got a little it, wear. I on. haven't even seen it. I haven't even seen yeah. it. I haven't seen it. It went straight to you guys. I, I talked to Yoel, and uh, I just uh, I bought it from him, and then I just had it shipped to you guys. So I haven't even physically looked at that car and, 10 years at least yeah when you were uh headed out to hollywood did you have the super in mind or did you get a little money and it was like all right i gotta i gotta buy something cool yeah it was just i gotta buy something cool and the super was a cool car back then this is i guess this is like no i was on i first got on tv in 94 so that's when i first started making money so i bet it was like 95 i think when i got that car yeah and it was just back then the super turbo was the car oh yeah you know, like like the one that, that they have now. The, the one they have now is amazing. I, I've thought about getting one of the new ones now. They're they're incredible. I love the way they look. Yeah, they're cool. Man, when I was like 16, that was I was looking at a Supra, a Typhoon, huh. and a 69 Camaro, which it each <laughs> one of the yeah, they're all over the all over the board, but like I ended up with the 69 Camaro mm -hmm. and restoring it. But that changed like my course of life. Like I always yeah. wonder if I'd have gone like for the Supra or the Typhoon. What I'd be doing, I'd probably be like just hanging out in clubs or something. You think so? Un un unemployed. I don't know what direction I'd go. It's I think <laughs> if you have a love of muscle cars, you always get drawn back into them. I really believe that. I just, I just think there's something about those things, man. Like, if you can afford one, like 
I, I always tell people to get them. I'm telling all my friends to get them. You know, like, oh, I don't know, is it practical? Shut the fuck up about practical. <laughs> Go get that goddamn thing. Can you afford it? Like, I, want, I tell everybody, like, think back when you were 16. You know, what would you tell yourself when you were 16? Like, you know, like, if you were 16 years old, you, you thought about, like, one day if I have money, I'm going to get one of these. Well, fucking get one of those. How, you know, how, it's just like, how much of these guys that you've gotten, uh, comedians and friends that have moved to Austin, you know, that have come from that Hollywood lifestyle or other places that have really embraced your lifestyle, whether it be hunting, guns, drinking whiskey, smoking cigars, muscle cars, like, are they, are they embrace, have they moved to Texas and been like, yeah, fuck yeah, America, you know, are they getting, well, a lot of them have, yeah, a, lot, a lot of them have gone, fuck yeah, America, <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of them fled California. And I was, you know, I was like, a lot of my friends were very skeptical because I was saying early on in the pandemic, I'm like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. I'm like, this place is going to shit. And they're like, it'll be fine. It's going to turn around. It's just, everything's crazy right now. I go, things don't get better, man. They don't get better under this government. They don't get better under these people. I go, they, they're clamping down on rights. They're clamping down on our ability to do things. I'm like, I got to get the fuck out of here. And Texas always spoke to me. There's something about the freedom of this place, and there's something about this. The 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 people are so fucking cool here. It's just so much better in every way. It's like the best move I ever made in my life was coming here. And when I first started coming here, um, we came here in in May of 2020. And you know, originally we're kind of looking at this place as like maybe we'll get a vacation house or something like that and come spend some time in Austin. But I could I I didn't know if I would be able to really live here. But my kids loved it. My kids, like, because it was in the middle of pandemic in California. Everybody had to wear a mask, even outside. It was so fucking stupid. And then we went to Texas, and no one had a mask on. And everyone's just out partying. And we went to the lake. We, we were on Lake Austin. And um, the real estate agent who showed us the house was so smart. She took us out on a boat ride. <laughs> and my, my girls it. were jumping in the water. We're swimming around. And everybody's, like, playing music and partying. And they were like, we want to live here. So... That was like step one, was like that they were into it. And my wife was a little reluctant at first, but eventually she was like, okay, we'll try it. We'll try it for a little while. Like, look, we'll keep our house in LA. If we don't like it, we could always go back. But as time went on, I was right. And LA fell further and further apart. And now you go back there, it's a fucking disaster. It's so bad. And the comedy scene's falling apart. But a lot of that is because everybody moved here. And so when I came here, you know, I just immediately started telling my friends, I'm like, look, you could live here. Like, I'm telling you, it's a better place to live. And I'm going to open up a comedy club. So if you guys want to live here and you want to come out, like, let's fucking do something here. And Tony Hinchcliffe was the first. He moved out here. Then Tom Segura moved out here and his wife, Christina Pazitsky, who's also hilarious. She's a great comic. And then um, once we started doing shows here and California didn't have any shows, you couldn't do any indoor shows for like a fucking year and a half. And we were rocking out here. I was doing Stubbs barbecue outside with Dave Chappelle in the middle of the pandemic. And we were uh, testing the entire audience beforehand. So we had people get there half hour before the show. We COVID test everybody and then funnel them in. And we were having fun. And then we started doing indoor shows. And then we started indoor indoor shows. I was sending people videos and sending my and Ron White had already lived here. And Ron White is like a legend in yep. stand-up comedy. Ron White, by the way, has a sick uh, Series 1 Corvette. I think he had, it's a 58, I think. What, you, what year did the Corvette start? What, they, what year did they start 53, making 53, but nobody gets the, I the think, 56. 56 probably would have been the first year people actually got one. seek out, yeah. you know? Yeah, Ron White has a sick 58. It's fucking beautiful. And uh, Casey Colvin out here has done a bunch of work on his and, like, tuned it up and and uh, changed it to fuel injection and d fixed the brakes and a bunch of stuff. So, uh, you know, I, I always knew that Ron was out here and Ron started doing shows out here. But we started sending, I started sending videos to these other comics. I'm like, look, we're having fun out here. Come, come visit. So a bunch of guys came to visit and then they started looking at real estate like immediately. <clears throat> and then next thing you know, we have like the biggest thriving community in all of comedy right here in Austin. And now that my club has opened up, now everybody's just fucking gung ho. I mean, now it's incredible. We got guys moving here from New York, and there's four comedy clubs on one block out here. I mean, it's incredible. You can go from from the comedy mothership. You go two doors down, 
there's the Sunset Strip Club that's like 500 seats. It's only two doors down. And then you got the Vulcan Gas Company. It's another comedy club that's a half a block away. And then you got the Creek in the Cave that's a block away from that. It's it's an amazing yeah, scene awesome. out here. And so all these guys that came out here, you know, I've taken them all shooting guns. I take them to the range. You know, there's lakes out here. Guys are going fishing all the time. It's just a way better lifestyle. It's just way better in every way. Yeah, you really hear, never hear anybody that's moved out to Texas. It's like, yeah, fuck this. I, I want to move back. It's yeah, just, no, it's, no, no, no. It's horrible. No. I'm never going. And it's tough to argue. Like, we lost a, a guy who was like my right-hand man, one of my best buddies, worked together for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. And he sat down with me. He's like, ah, I'm moving out to Austin, Texas. And how am I going to argue that? I'm going to be like, no, nah, you don't want to do that. You don't want to Chicago. Go. Yeah, you're in. This is beautiful. <laughs> hey, dude, Mon <laughs> Mundelein, Illinois, man. We can. Well, what? Well, no, we really can't do shit here. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a great place to live. But yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the guys that I've brought out here, I've turned them onto a lot of cool shit. I haven't gotten any of them to go bow hunting yet, but <laughs> you know, I'm pretty extreme. I don't expect people to do everything I do. You know, that's I, it, most people don't want to do everything I do. Well, you but see, like you seek out shit. you seek out stuff that's hard and hurts. And most people don't want to do that shit. Um, hard and hurts, but it's rewarding. Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I seek out things that are difficult because I think that that's how you learn about yourself. That's how you get. Yeah, that's how you become a better person. And I think that makes you better at everything. I think difficult things that are challenging and exciting, they make you better at everything you do. So, and I've always gravitated towards things that are scary things that are hard to do that's what i like to do i like to do things that that challenge me so whether it was fighting at first or stand-up comedy after that or you know doing podcasts or all this stuff and now bow hunting i like and working out of course i, I just i just like challenging shit i've always I mean, it just it keeps me sane you know i've got a unusual mm -hmm. mind and my mind like it need it. I can't just sit idle. I I, I lose my fucking marbles. I I have to do shit. If I if I'm just sitting there, I start like pacing, and staring at the walls. I need to do stuff, and I figured that out luckily early on in life, so I don't wind up in prison. <laughs> I figured out that I have to do something with challenging and exciting all the time. And if I don't do that, I don't feel right. But if I do do that, I'm the nicest guy in the world. Like I'm so happy and peaceful, and it's like. As long as I just squeeze all that caveman <laughs> out of me, yeah, I'm with you. You know, it's like I can be a better person. How so early? How early on did you realize that? Like almost immediately. Like my parents talk about it. Like what I was like before I started fighting, and then when I started fighting. Like when I started doing martial arts, when I really got into it, I was like 14, 15. It's like my mom talks about it. It's like I was two different people. I was this wild, scary kid who was just reckless and angry, and then all of a sudden, super focused and super disciplined. And so I realized very early on, because like martial arts was the first thing that I ever did where I realized like, hey, maybe I'm not a loser, you know, because everything before, like I was insecure, you know, my parents split up when I was real young, and you know, I have a great stepdad, awesome dude. <clears throat> And him and my mom been together for 50 years now. So it's like they have a great relationship. But we moved around a lot. So like I I lived in, um, San, we moved to, from New Jersey to San Francisco when I was seven. We lived there until I was 11. Then we moved to Florida. And I lived there from 11 to 13. And then Boston from 13 to 24. So it was like, I was always moving. And so I didn't have like a good group of friends. And I was kind of insecure. And, you know, and I, I was getting bullied. You know, when I go to these new schools, so that's like, I, I got to learn how to fight. And so that's when I started doing martial arts. And it just changed who I am. It's like, it gave me a thing where I realized, like, if you dedicate yourself to something, you can be someone. You could actually be, you could actually be happy with who you are instead of feeling like a failure. Instead of feeling like this insecure weirdo. Like, now I felt like I was, I was someone important. You know, I could, I, could, I could actually, I was getting praise for what I did. I, I realized I was actually good at this. And then I won a bunch of tournaments and I won the state championship four years in a row. And I won the, the U.S. Open and all these other tournaments. And I, I just really got into that. And then that just sort of defined the whole rest of my life. Because I realized if you go all in on something, 
and you really push yourself and dedicate yourself, you see these incremental steps of growth. And that an understanding that that process exists in everything you do. And it exists in whatever art you pursue, whatever, whatever you try to do in life. I mean, everything from trying to be a better husband and be a better father, be a better friend, be a better neighbor, like everything you do, you get better at with time and focus. And that was just a lesson that I learned when I was a young kid, luckily. I mean, I always wonder like what would have happened to me if I didn't discover martial arts? It, you know, I would have been a completely different person. I'd probably been very lost. You gotta, have, you gotta have that one thing. Yeah, that passion. I, yeah, not like to compare myself to you, but the, <laughs> the only thing for me was cars. Like yeah. I, I was the same time. I did. I couldn't not even get any sports, anything like that. And I think about well, if I didn't find cars and realize that I'm pretty good at doing things with my hands, I don't know what the fuck I'd be doing. And drugs right and now. fighting or what? I mean, something. Probably, yeah, like, fighting. Not very good at it though. Stupid. Like you know, I'm not yeah. Joe's size. I'd Most be my people ass that are in <laughs> jail are in jail because they, you know, they grew up in a terrible environment. They had bad guidance, you know, and a bunch of bad experiences with people around. They fell in with the wrong crowd. They got the wrong ideas about what to do with life, and they they never developed a real direction. And I think that that you know that's that's tragic, and that that could happen to any of us. You know, it's just. You find a thing that you love, whether it's uh, building cars or art or music or whatever the fuck it is that it that, that speaks to you. You can find that thing and you realize like, oh, this is like part of what what I think there's like human reward systems that are built into people from all of our genetics and all of uh, all of evolution. And these human reward systems, they re reward problem solving, and they reward like task oriented goals where you're creating something and accomplishing something. And if you, that's like what literally led us out of the caves and, and, and us to create cities and agriculture. It's all this figuring out how to do things better. And when people don't do those things, they get depressed, they feel lost and aimless. And that's a lot of people out there that are on medication because their life sucks and and it's so like i don't think that's the solution i think i mean there's definitely people that are that have chemical imbalances and this it's great that there's stuff that can treat people like that but there's also people that just live a life that sucks oh, yeah. their life just is not exciting it's not interesting they you know it's like there's a great quote by thoreau that i always use and it's that most men live lives of quiet desperation mm -hmm. and if you're stuck doing something that you don't want to do, that doesn't give you any joy, that you don't get excited about, that you have no passion for, and you do that most of the day, and then by the time the day is done, you come home, and you just want to have a cocktail, and you watch TV, and you get up in the morning, your body's falling apart, and you're just doing the same fucking thing until your heart stops beating. And that's a lot of us. And that's a lot of us. Your mind is never solving the population. problems. Yeah, your mind, numb. yes. It's never working on a problem. If you're passionate about something, it's constantly solving a problem to get better at that thing you're so passionate about. If you're, like you said, you're going through the motions at a job that you fucking hate, it, your mind's not solving a problem of how to get, you're just yeah. fucking miserable. And there's also like what you guys do is there's the joy of creation. You know, when you guys start out with just a, a raw car, an old, beat up car and you remove the panels and you, you change the frame and you change the suspension and you start working on everything. And then all of a sudden, bam, you got a car like that 69 Camaro that you guys made for me. I mean, I, I sent you that car. It was a friend of mine. He had that Camaro and you know, he's like, I don't drive it. It's just sitting around. Do you want it? And I looked at it. I was like, Rose to show. <laughs> okay, let's go. Let's go. And now it's a, a, a masterpiece, you know, and I know for you guys, this, the satisfaction of being able to create something like that and put it together, like that's a joy and life should be about those joys. It should be about like finding that thing that gives you pleasure, that gives you joy. And I think a lot of it is, you know, like whatever speaks to you. And, you, and everybody's different, man. Some people, it's fucking playing the violin. Yeah. Some people, it's building muscle cars. It's like, it's just what speaks to you. Yeah, it's you crazy. You feel like you ever get to the point where you've mastered something and can't take it any further? Or do you then go back and find weaknesses and punch holes in it and keep taking it further and further? Or do you shift Well, luckily, shift the things that I else? like, you can never master. <laughs> you know, the, the things I like, you never master. Like stand-up comedy, 
you always have to write new material. You're always writing new jokes. You're, every show is a new show. You, you, there's always new things you have to add. You put out special. You got to start from scratch. In jujitsu, there's always someone who can kick my ass. It's like there's no way to master it. You get better constantly. It's a constant process, but you never get better. Same thing with bow hunting. You 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 get better. Excuse me, but you never master it. Like you you just it's a constant process of ever improvement and practice. It's like those it, are the things that I'm that I get excited about. It's like any art. You can never master it. Car building is the same way. If you think you mastered yeah. it. Yeah, there's no end. There's yeah, no finish. If you think you mastered it right. and you're comfortable where you're at, dude, somebody's going to kick your ass. You're going to get blown over. Right, because you think you don't Just look at what better. you guys do. Look at what you guys do in comparison to the original cars. I mean, think about that. Like, Think about like an original 1969 Camaro and how they drive and yeah. handle and the capabilities of them and then what you guys build. And we I drove mean, yours when it showed up. It was it was something. Yeah, it sucked. It, yeah. it was it's fucking horrible. It was fucking horrible. Yeah. Man. <laughs> I was. I mean, like, it's still fun. They're still fun yeah. to drive, but man, the difference is. It is, dude. Day. When that one when that one showed up too, I'm like, Josh. I'm like, dude, you gotta you gotta call Joe and tell him this thing's like it's, it's a pile of shit. Like, I don't know how to. <laughs> I yeah. I haven't met Joe yet. I'm not gonna call him and tell him that. You gotta tell him this thing's fucked. We just didn't know what the expectation. Like you said, we were talking about doing a survivor at that point and not doing the paint yeah. or whatever. And then it was kind of like, yeah, man, if we're gonna do it, like let's do it. And you didn't hesitate. You're like, I want it right. Make yeah. it right. Yeah. On the uh, listened. on the creating on the creating thing. Uh, back to like you were talking about us on building cars and stuff. On on your side as far as comedy and writing lines and stuff is that. Is that an idea that comes in your head and you're like, boom, I've got it and I hone it? Or is it you're creating along the way where you might have a, a just a glimmer of an idea that you've got to continue to work on for however long until you know that it's ready, you know, joke-wise or bit or whatever? It's different with every bit. Some bits, they almost come to you in full form. I've had bits that, like, the moment I wrote it out, like sitting in front of my computer, a, a, an idea comes... And then I bring it on stage and it fucking kills that night. And and then like my friends would be like, holy shit, is that new? Why would you come up with that one? I was like, dude, I wrote that one last night. And then there's other ones that I can't give up on them because I know there's something there, but they just suck. Like I'll, I'll, there's something there, but I don't know how to do it. And they're coming off clunky. And so I have to rework them. I have to, I get home and I'll smoke weed and stare at the computer and just try to figure out how to make them work. And then I'll try to do them different ways. You know, it's like every bit is different. Like I had this one bit that I used to do of, about uh, watching uh, Tigers fuck on uh, the Discovery <laughs> Channel. And it took me like it used to bomb. Like I used to put it in the middle of my act. And it would create this big hole. And then I have to dig myself out of the hole. <laughs> and it got to the point where I was like, man, I should probably abandon that fucking joke. <laughs> and then one day I figured out how to do it. Then I couldn't follow it. And then I had to put it at the end because it was it was the best bit I ever wrote. But it, it just took a long time of like working it and figuring out what is it? Like what what is it about it? And I had, just, I had to find the right angle. So it's a lot of trial and error. It's a long, like, grinding process sometimes. And it just, you just got to, like, trust that process. And there's there's bits that uh, that are new bits that I'm doing right now that are so exciting because I know that just three months ago they sucked. And now they're just monsters. They're killers. And it's just one of those things. It's, you just, it's just work. It's time and work. But it's so, it's so satisfying when they all come together. And comedy is one of the, the unique things where there's no one else that's giving you input. It's all like you come up with the idea, you figure out how to execute it, you edit it, you perform it, you do everything. So when it comes together, it's like a little piece of you. Are you, um, have you ever had bits that you've got in process? Like you said, it's not ready, I'm still honing on it. And then you see another stand up, kill it with something that's very similar to like your idea or mentality. And are you like, fuck it. I, I, I can't do that one. That's done. And he, how did he get to that one before me? Are you ever looking at it like, well, shit, that was a way better way of doing it than what I've got wrote down. Yeah. There's always parallel thinking. And with some subjects, like some things come up 
where like everybody's talking about right. it, you know, like whatever it is. There's there's always something like Joe Biden. Like if you want to do a joke about Biden, <laughs> yeah, yeah Biden pr- being pr- pretty retarded. fucking easy. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> plenty of fucking people. Yeah, that's low that hanging fruit. That. Yeah, right. You could be on a show with three or four dudes who do jokes about Biden being a walking dead man. Right. You know, so it's like there's certain things that is low hanging fruit, and you'll get a lot of people do. It. But I'd like to try to pick ideas that are. Uh, a little more difficult and and also ideas that like make you think like so i i try to find things like there's a few bits that i have that I, like i don't think anybody's gonna do a bit on this because it's like i had this bit about how the kardashians were all demons and that uh at night they talk bruce jenner to becoming a chick while he's sleeping <laughs> and it that's another bit like took me forever to do but it's real physical. Like I would climb on top of the stool <laughs> and I, I would say that at the, at, at, like when he goes to sleep, they, they, they kick off their shoes to reveal black Raven's claws that <laughs> clutch the edge of the bed. And they whisper in his ear. It was like this fucked up bit that took forever to do. Cause I had to figure out how to do it, but it's so physical. Like I, it's like, I'm like almost doing the splits at one point in time where I'm like holding on to the this stool and I kick my leg way up in there to kick the shoes off and then I'm saying blue. <laughs> like you better if you were one of us. And he's like, I can't be one of you. I was born a man. Nonsense. It's like this crazy bit where like a demon is like talking him into becoming a chick. It's like no one's gonna steal that bit. Yeah, that's like, pretty fresh. Like, no one's gonna come so, up with that. First of all, you wouldn't be able to do it because you can't like hold on to a, a stool and do the splits. And and then it's also it's like you wouldn't want to do that. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, why are you doing that? So you're obviously. So it's like you're obviously guys. you're obviously fairly fucking high then when you think of that <laughs> skit, oh, right? As, like as a kite. <laughs> yeah, I was right. you're fucking gone. Yeah, <laughs> I was. I remember I got a cover of Vanity Fair and Bruce Jenner was on the cover of Vanity or Caitlyn Jenner at the time was on the cover of Vanity Fair, and I was like, "What the fuck is going on?" <laughs> I was like, "I was like, this is wild." I was like, "Donald Trump is a president and Bruce Jenner's a chick. This is crazy." <laughs> And I, remember, I remember like writing that out, like trying to figure out how to make that bit work. Fuck. Can you imagine going back in fucking time? Like we were talking about that. We were t- watching the fight uh, last weekend. We're sitting there, me and my son are watching, and me and uh, Jeremy are talking about it the day after. You're looking at this is 2023, you know, oh, yeah. badass <laughs> UFC fight. You've got Donald Trump, Kid Rock, and Mike Tyson. Like three. <laughs> yeah, and right. you're like, fucking America. Like, yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Dude, when Trump walked in, first of all, they love Trump in Florida. Hell Holy yeah. shit. When he walked in, the entire crowd, I mean, what was it, 17, 18,000 people was like, you ass at it, you ass at it, you ass at it. It was like bone chilling. It was like, woo. It was pretty wild. It was pretty wild. Like, all the narrative that, like, people hate Trump and, like, like this narrative that the media tries to shove down everybody's face, like, People are so sick of this current government. They're oh, yeah. so yeah. sick of what this woke agenda and all this bullshit. They're trying to stuff down people's throats while they're stealing money and insider trading and all the fucking nonsense that's going on. That that guy showing up, it like shows you why Ron DeSantis is so loved there, yeah. why Trump is so loved there. It's pretty fascinating to watch. It's why, man, both those DeSantis and Trump get some balls, you know. You gotta fucking yeah, you just, him. Like you said, you're not worried about the, right. the thing. They're just so worried about keeping us all at each other's throats. Yeah. If it wasn't for all that shit, we there's so many things that we would like both sides would get the fuck along over. Like you said, muscle cars is one of them. Like <laughs> yeah, you've got uh, on the ballot for 24. Yeah, muscle right. Cars. Even Biden's fucking crippled ass got a C2 vet. Yeah, yeah. I think that was just uh, that's where he stored his. Illegal documents. Documents. Yeah. I don't yeah. think he's got the vet anymore. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, he had documents yeah. in the back seat of that thing. Like, what the uh, fuck, for, yeah, man? For a small car, I have dude. a C2. I have a, a 65 convertible. I love it. Oh, I it's seen got a LS1 one. in it. Yeah, it, that fucking thing's beautiful. I love that car. Yeah, those are fun cars, cars to drive, man. That's a six-speed or something in it? Oh, yeah. 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 Six-speed LS1. Yeah, Steve Stroke did a bunch of work on that, too. He put a supercharger on it. Have you got the Nova yet? I have not got the Nova yet. It's uh, close. He he built it with uh, out power steering. I'm like, mm, yeah. should probably add some power steering. That's a fucking heavy ass car. 
Yeah, that's not like the 93 RS America. You, you want to have power steering on a 70 Nova, you know, or 69 Nova. Yeah, either that or like a fucking steering wheel. Yeah, so some leverage. Yeah. Or arms. Yeah, like I mean, it'd be maybe. a good forearm workout, <laughs> I guess. But yeah. like parking it would be a nightmare. Oh, you look you like know? a complete asshole. Yeah, trying to <laughs> yeah, like. Exactly. It's just not fun. <laughs> not fun to park. You know? How do you handle that when you get out? If you, I mean, you're a man of not much free time, but you got a shit ton of fucking hobbies. So you're able to work some stuff in. If you get, you know, an hour, two hours, three hours, whatever, you're going to pop out. You're going to take the Chevelle, the Camaro, the vet, whatever it is, and go go run through the countryside and do that. You got to stop, get gas. You got to do that. How do you handle a potential issue, crowd, people, you know, aggravating you, bothering you, whatever? Is that just. Fuck it, I'm just going to go out and have fun. Well, especially when you're not in exactly like a discreet vehicle. Well, yeah, you're not a discreet yeah. vehicle. Yeah. Well, n- almost everybody's just friendly. It's just a bunch of people being friendly. Like, it's never a problem. It's just people that want to take pictures or say hi. You know, it's it's just what comes with the gig. You yep. know, it's no big deal. It's They're all cool. Like, 99% of people when they see, more than 99%. Like, I've had very few people not be cool. It's almost everyone that is just, what's up? It's like, it's fine. It's no big deal. That's Sometimes cool. they get a little crazy. They want to tell you about some fucking business opportunity. That yeah. shit gets annoying. You know, they want to they want to pitch something to you. I'm like, I'm busy, man. I can't do anything more than what I'm doing. Dude, do not I gotta don't go. pitch them that business opportunity. I got a couple <laughs> ideas here, some Polaroids. Yeah. Yeah. It's like people have this idea that the way to success is to find someone else successful yeah. and just fucking hitch a ride. And uh, that's... That's not real. Like you can't, that's, that's a, a misnomer. It is interesting. Like you said, that most people are not, and it has to do with, you know, the car thing, bringing it back full circle. Um, I mean, some of the <clears throat> YouTube videos that we've done, you know, that features your car or whatever. And you I mean, millions of views and I mean, thousands and thousands of comments and you go through and for the most part, everybody's kind of like badass car. Joe's got taste. Fuck. Yeah. Joe Rogan. Got, everything's positive. You know, badass car. Yeah. I love this. Or I would, you know, Maybe change the wheels. or Everybody's got a little tweak, but it's not like, fuck Joe. But you go to like your Instagram where it's just like a picture of you cutting some meat and it's like, Joe Rogan fucking sucks. Fuck Joe Rogan. I can't believe he would cut the meat that way. It's like, <laughs> really? what the fuck? Like, there's just. First like, of all, I don't read comments, I know. so I have no idea that that's happening, but yeah. I didn't know that people are saying, fuck your meat. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny but how. You know, this like social media is weird, you know? Social media is it's a, a magnifying glass for the some of the worst aspects of people. Why but you, also a lot of cool stuff there too. Oh, well, you can yeah. find a lot of cool shit. I mean, they, I don't the amount of makers the and stuff is, that you can You can't read get. comments. Yeah. Can't read comments. I tell every co- every comedian, don't ever read the comments. Just post and ghost. People are allowed to have their opinions about you. That's part of the game. You put stuff out there, people can say you suck, people can love you. You know, just do your best. Do your best, and, you know, if you read too many positive comments, you'll get a big head. It'll distort your perception of reality. Yep. And if you read negative comments, you think the world hates you. It's like it's not good for you. It's interesting you're talking about to get a big head. I was going to ask you, when you, you said, you know, growing up, moved around, bullied, had some low self-esteem, you got fighting, you got that. Was there ever a point you've obviously kept a very level head and you're very grounded and down to earth? But you've also ran in some fucking circles. I mean, being in Hollywood and being in TV and being in stuff. Have you ever had to have that talk with yourself of like, hey, I'm getting a little too fucking big for my britches or I'm, I'm you know what I'm saying? I'm going down a path that I, it's, that I don't like. Or have you always just been like, fuck it, I'm me. I, I, I just would like to know if there's ever been that internal struggle of like telling yourself how fucking badass you are after, you know what I'm saying? I've never had a conversation with myself where I told myself how badass I am. <laughs> this is coming from this Josh. is coming no. from Josh. He no. regularly does no. that. So. I'm just, but he has me to be never. like Josh. You're not Knocking that fucking down. badass. I'm like you're, anybody, no, okay. anybody that has that level of success, I would assume, it has some you know self awareness at some point. Like you said, and you're trying to always become a better person. Um, how do you keep yourself from going down you know a path that you've seen other people go down? Um, well, first of all, fame happened to me nice and slow. It was like a slow drip. You know, I was on a sitcom with seven other people. Most people, I would never got recognized anywhere. Very rarely do people know who I was. And then I was on Fear Factor and that was a lot more like popular and a lot more notoriety, but it was okay. It was like, it was doable. And then the podcast happened and the UFC and the podcast kind of happened around the same time. It's like, the UFC happened first, 
you know, I was working for the UFC. I actually started working for the UFC back in 97. And I, I did that back when it was like banned from cable and, you know, you could only get it if you had a satellite dish. And it, to me, it was just, I was a lifelong martial artist and I was excited about the concept of getting all these different styles together. And so I got recognized a little bit from the UFC. And then after my podcast took off, my podcast took off a few years after the UFC took off. And it was just like all these things kind of compounded. And then somewhere around like, I guess it was like 2013, 2014, it started getting really weird. That's when it started getting crazy. And by then I had already kind of had an understanding of who I was, you know, and a lot of it is also martial arts because, you know, when you're doing martial arts all the time, you're always getting your ass kicked. So you're always humbled. Sure. And then if it wasn't for martial arts, the other stuff that I do, the workouts, they're so fucking brutal. You just, you break yourself. And if you, you break all the time, you don't ever get this chance to like have a distorted perception of yourself because you know, like you have limitations, you know, that you're always constantly trying to get better. And if you're spending any time thinking about what an amazing fucking human you are, what a killer you are, you're such a badass, that time is you're robbing yourself of that, that energy that you could be using to improve yourself. And so I look at any kind of like mental weakness like that, where you have a distorted perception of reality or where you're full of yourself, that's poison. That stuff's poison and it gets in the way of progress. And so I've never gravitated towards it. I'm not interested in it. I'm, I just, it doesn't, I don't know, just for what, what I'm doing in my life, it just doesn't, it has no place. So luckily uh, I have that mindset and I've always kind of had that mindset. So I've managed to avoid most of that shit. That's cool. It, it helps. Like you said, when you've, when you fought, and no matter how badass you think you are, there's, you find somebody that it is a little bit more badass. Usually those guys that that can say that I'll whip anybody, they've never been in a like a real fight. Generally. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're, you're Blaze is fighters that are some of the fucking <laughs> nicest people in the world. They're some of the coolest, friendliest. Like, if you ever met Israel Adesanya in real life, you would never imagine that guy's one of the baddest motherfuckers on earth. Really? You would think, oh, well, this is a cool guy. He's so, so friendly, so normal. Meanwhile, he's just a straight-up assassin. It's yeah. just like those guys, they, they get humble. They get humbled on a daily basis just through training. And even when they win, you know, they're just happy to celebrate the accomplishment. But then it's like back to the process, right back to the grind. Well, before I forget, you talked about, you know, uh, your inner struggle and, and getting into fighting and, and what it did for you. Uh, I cannot thank you enough. A couple years ago when we were out, you, you took way more time than you should have with my son, Blaze, and talked to him and... He had already idolized you and put you on a pedestal. And after that talk, I mean, honestly, for the last two years, you have changed that kid's direction in life. And he is completely sold out to fighting and training and stuff like that. And I mean, looks up to you. And for you to take that time when, you know, you had other things going on, I, I cannot thank you enough. Oh, it's my pleasure. I love doing that. Because, you know, I remember when I was a kid, like what it was like to me to, to, to talk to people that, that I thought were important or interesting. So especially with kids, I, I always try to go out of my way to have conversations with them and, you know, give them encouragement. And, you know, I remember when I was a kid, that, that means a lot. It means a lot. It's not as simple as just talking to an, I mean, talking to an adult means a lot. If I talk to a famous person, it means a lot to me, someone I admire, it's cool. But when, you know, when I was a kid, I mean, that's, that's fuel that could change your whole life. And it's so easy for a person like me to do so easy to do. And you could, literally change oh, yeah. the direction of a kid's life maybe he'll listen to this episode and realize about like you know, bringing yourself down a notch and the the yeah, poison yeah. of getting yeah. in your own head <laughs> of thinking you're bad it's so bad for you yeah. it's so bad for you because everybody who's not a badass thinks that you know one day i'm gonna be a badass i'm gonna tell everybody <clears throat> to fuck off and but you never you, that's not real it's, it's it's just an imaginary thing that you see in movies like the the real badasses, they're the, the the nicest, friendliest people, and the battle is always with themselves. It's the battle is you against you every day, you against you trying to get better, you against you trying to improve. Just steady on your grind, and that's the hardest part about it is to just stay grinding, and that's that's really one of the things that separates people that succeed from people that don't 
is just embracing that struggle, that grind, oh, just yeah. keep going day in, day out. Like one of the things that made my podcast successful was that I do it four times a week. Like a sure. lot of, and I don't have to, like I could do it one time a week. I could not do it at all if I don't want to. But I would always tell these comedians, I was like, why are you only doing one a week? Like you could, you have the whole, you could do whatever the fuck you want. You, you're literally your own boss. You should be doing it every day. And I'm like, that's too much work. I'm like, that's how you get people addicted to the show. That's how you get more listeners. That's how it grows. Like, and that's also how you get like an unexpected education because you get to talk to all these different people and you learn about yourself. You learn about how they think. You learn about how different people live different lives and have different experiences. And, and you can like mentally profit from that. And, but it's just hard to stay steady. You got to stay on that grind. And that, that is like a lesson that everybody should learn. No matter what you do, it's all about how much time and how much effort you put into things and how much you're really thinking about them and trying to get better at them. And if you're not doing that, you're, you're kind of wasting time. Yeah. That's, that's a really good advice on your, on your podcast thing. You, I've, I've listened to you a bunch and I've, you know, heard, you know, you want to have conversations with guys you, you give a shit about talking to as long as you've done that now, looking back at it, we're asking, I mean, we've, we're not even a real podcast. It's a, you know, but it's a year and a half into it. We've done, you know, 60, Bro, 70 it's a real guys. podcast. Like you got mics, you got a desk <laughs> yeah. I'm on it. This is a real podcast. It's, it's real now. We yeah. just became real. It's, it's a real. stamp yeah. of approval right They're there. all real. Bro, go back and listen to our, my early podcast. It's like fucking a thousand listeners and no one gives a shit and we're high as fuck and no one's paying attention. <laughs> yeah, they were terrible. You go back and listen uh, to my early podcast. Yeah, well, we were terrible. drunk as fuck. But yeah, we, we're yeah, drunk we usually. Some, yeah. There's some listeners. Yeah. So, <laughs> me too. We're, we, what we've learned, what we've, we've learned so many amazing things, but the, what, the main takeaway that we talk about all the time is that we really, there is no expectations because as soon as we have an expectation for a guest or where a conversation is going to go, it's exactly the opposite. We've had guys that we were super excited and we were, we knew we were going to be able to dig into so much stuff or whatever. And sometimes they fell a little flat, you know, and it's nothing about that guy that it, it just doesn't have a, he doesn't conversate well. well, or he's a little nervous or he's something like that. Yeah. And then there's guys that you don't think are going to do well that come in and just fucking crush. Yeah. Have you, have you learned a pattern? Have you, can you know what one's going to be like kind of beforehand based on, you know, the guy, or is it just a surprise every time? You never know. I mean, the hard one is writers because some writers, they talk like they write. So it's like labor. Cause a lot of times when people write, they think about a word, they write, they think more, they write, they think they write. So when those guys talk, sometimes they talk and they think and they talk and they, um, and they talk and it gets, they're not good at it. You know, they're just not good at that, but they're interesting. So it's like the battle is the struggle is trying to like, pull the interesting information out of them and, and put it in a presentable form. And sometimes that's hard. And then some people shock you. And, you know, sometimes like you'll have an artist on and they're the most interesting person you've ever talked to. And they could talk forever about anything. You know, it's really different with different people. But, you know, the what's fascinating to me is how so many different people think so differently about all kinds of aspects of life. And that's the thing that's been the most shocking about the podcast is what I talked about earlier. You like you get an unexpected education. Like yeah, I didn't yeah. plan on talking to hundreds of scientists and hundreds of professors and all the all these different fascinating people and and get so many different views of uh, of how they view the world and how they see things and what they've experienced and what they've learned and what they know and. You know, you add that to your life and it's just, it's, it's an amazing opportunity to just educate yourself. Yeah, it truly is, man. I mean, I, I listen to your podcast pretty regularly and it's, it's actually educational. Like you learn some shit, you know, when like I was make fun <clears> of my <throat> wife cause she's sits around and reads these like crazy novels and I'm like, you are just reading nonsense, complete fucking nonsense. Made up stories. Know? Yeah. There's nothing but, wrong with made-up stories. Well, but yeah, but if I'm listening to something or I'm spending time doing it, I want to be, like, educated. I want to be learning something. Right. And you I think you do a phenomenal job of asking, like, all the questions that somehow most of the audience wants to hear and not uh, being self-conscious to not know and be, like, okay asking to pull that information from the expert. 
that you hear a lot of podcasts, they want to be the expert and they want to show off to the guest. Oh yeah. And what yeah. they're, they know yeah, more than they do. Yeah, that's a trap. Right. That's a yeah. trap. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta get out of your own way. It's very important. And you gotta be like real present in the moment. You almost kind of have to be in a sense, you gotta be like in some way selfless. Like you don't think about yourself at all, but I do think about like questions, like, and the questions, they're organic, right? Like when someone says something and there's like a puzzle I have in my head, like, what does that mean? Why, why'd you do it that way? Like, why did they start that? Why did they do this? And it's just, it's gotta be organic. And a lot of that just comes from, you know, I've done 2000 plus podcasts, a lot of fucking podcasts. There's so many of them that along the way, you just, you just learn how to do it better. I never thought of uh, podcasting or conversations like an art form before I did it. But then once I that did is. it and started seeing people that suck at it, like some people <laughs> that just talk over their guests, they don't listen. They're just waiting for their chance to talk. It's like you're doing, you're making a shitty product yeah. and it really is like, it's an audio visual form of art of the conversation. Like there's an art to having a conversation. And it's so painful when you hang out with people and they're not good at it. And they just, they, they're clunky and they talk over everybody and they don't listen. It's just not fun. But then when you talk to someone who's engaging and really, really there and, and you're really experiencing how their mind works and in their experiencing how your mind works, it's very fun. In today's day and age with fucking TikTok and the instant gratification and the, the new generation, why the fuck do you think anybody sits down and listens to a conversation with two people sometimes on a topic that they have no interest in, but they're going to listen to the whole fucking three hours. It's probably, yeah, it's probably it's, more it's unusual. Interesting. Well, I think more people than we would like to admit um, have a, an appetite for interesting things. The, the, the short attention span stuff like TikTok, it's, it grabs you, but it doesn't nourish you. Like it just gives you this thing and it just, you can just get sucked into it and just keep scrolling and keep mindlessly absorbing very fast, short attention span shit. But, you know, there's a lot of people in the beginning of the podcast, when I first started doing they were like, you should edit your podcast, they're too long. And I'm like, well, they won't listen. If it's too long, don't listen. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Like, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. The way I want to do it is I want to have long conversations with people. Because I feel like when you talk to someone for three hours, which is generally the time of my podcast, the length of them, in three hours, you really get to know how a person thinks. You really get into the weeds about subjects, especially like complex subjects. Like you'll see someone on a new show talk about like there's a, for instance, there's this guy um, who was uh, he he owns White Oak Pastures and uh, he came on my podcast. I had seen him on Fox News and he did this thing. And he talks very slowly and very deliberately. And like, awesome. you can't have a guy like that. He's awesome. But you can't have a guy like that talk for fucking four minutes. Like in four minutes, like the host was trying to urge him to talk faster. And then, uh, and I saw him. I'm like, I need to talk to that guy. His name's Will Harris. He's amazing. And I, I contacted him. I'm like, come on my show, man. I'll give you all the time you need. And so he and I had an amazing conversation about regenerative agriculture and the way he does his farm with no pesticides or herbicides and just having everything organically interact with each other the way it would in nature. It's a fascinating conversation. But you need hours. With, you, don't, you, you need to let that guy express himself for, you know, it might be 10, 15 minutes before I get to talk again. Like I'm, I'm asking him a question. And he's expanding upon these very complex systems of the, you know, this agriculture and, and, and natural biological systems of his farm and how he uh, cultivated them. And it took him like 20 years to turn his farm from an industrial farm to a regenerative farm. It was an amazing conversation, but that's where a three hour podcast shines. And I think the other thing about podcasts is people enjoy them while they're doing other stuff. Sure. Like you'll enjoy it while you're at work, you know, like maybe you have like some something you do where you could listen to music or listen to stuff while you're at work. But podcasts, like you got get an education while you're doing other stuff or maybe you're doing you have a commute. You know, to me, I listen to a lot of stuff. I listen to like audiobooks a lot when I'm in the sauna because I'm just sitting there for 20 minutes cooking. So I'm like, why don't I just listen to a book? And so like every day I get 20 minutes of audiobook in the sauna. 
Yeah, it's it's wild to me in this that that they consume media this way, and like you said, long format conversations with everything else in life tells you that this would not be something that people would be interested in. It's almost probably because it's like it's so rare in today's day and age, especially with younger people, that to yeah. sit down and actually have a conversation. Or to be a part of a conversation. They'd rather like that. they'd so rather listen to people have a conversation a, than actually yeah, go and have one. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm hoping yeah. I'm hoping that people are having those conversations now. And I think young people who get into the show probably do have those conversations with their friends now, because they they recognize that like there is a way to talk to people that's more enjoyable for everybody. And if you see people having conversations that are very interesting and they're exchanging ideas and you know there's no ego problems and there's just like this like cool way of uh figuring out each other and getting to know each other and getting to know each other's lives and i think that's kind of contagious like a lot of things it's if it's interesting to you to listen to you probably start to apply some of those uh, the aspects of podcasting and and good conversation to your life yeah it's, it's beneficial for sure in the uh I know I've listened to you before talk about it. You know, you had no idea it was going to be what it is now. What, at what point did you realize, holy fucking shit, this thing's like, this thing's crazy, the podcast specifically? I don't know, man. I mean, it's like, like I said, it's somewhere around 2012 or 2013, it started really getting nuts. And the whole time I did the podcast, I never paid attention to the numbers. Like, I still don't look at them. I never look at the numbers. I never look at the downloads. I just just do it. I just keep doing it. And once I've done, I never listen to it. I just get the fuck away. And somewhere along the line, I was in uh, Chicago, and I was doing the Chicago Theater. And I remember I had this bit where I was talking about something that happened on the podcast. And uh, so I had to explain it, and I said, uh, how many folks listen to the podcast? And there's 3,700 people in that place, and they just went, yeah, <laughs> and I remember going, oh shit, like that <laughs> moment. Like I expected a few people to like, yeah, 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 listen, but I didn't know how many people listened. It was nuts. And I remember being on stage going, oh no, like what, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> what did I say? Like, yeah, what, did, what did I say? I, that was like <laughs> well, at that moment I realized like, wow, this is crazy. Like all 3,700 people in this building listening to this podcast and it just kept getting bigger. Now it's number one in 96 countries. It's crazy. And it's been number one for fucking years. It's like, yeah. I keep telling Jamie, my producer, I'm like, when is somebody going to beat us? Like, when, when are they going to figure this out? I don't like, think I'm that's... not doing anything that different. Like, all I'm doing is talking to people. I'm just having a conversation. It's like, it's weird. It's And I'm not trying to pick guests. I'm like, this one's going to get a lot of downloads. I just pick whoever I think is interesting. I'm, like I had, um, I've had people on that like no one knows who they are. They're just like you know, just regular folks that I think are interesting. Like I had this lady on who was a, a beekeeper, you know, or I had uh, Jason Everman on on Monday, who was a guy who was he played in the early days of uh, Nirvana and he played in Soundgarden and then he went on to to join the military. He left being a rock star and uh, became a ranger and did tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, multiple tours in Afghanistan. One of the most fucking, and then graduated from Columbia after he got out of the military with a degree in philosophy. He's got a master's. And he's a fucking brilliant guy. Yeah. But nobody knows who the fuck he is. He's just interesting. And so I'm picking these people just only based on whether or not I want to talk to them. So... I, you know, I'm kind of stunned by it all still to this day, but I enjoy doing it. So I just keep doing it and, you know, just keep on trucking. Yeah. It's funny when you really try to like dig in and hand pick them, it doesn't work as well for us. We've had just, we've had a handful of customers on just car build customers. I mean, they're very accomplished guys, but they, they don't have a YouTube channel. They don't have, you know, some they don't have follow a huge Instagram, but they're yeah. just, cool fucking dudes that have successful businessmen an amazing story of things they've done throughout their life that it i think it really resonates with people because it gives you something to aspire to be you know it's really admirable to listen to that shit it's there's a lot of cool people in the world and most of them aren't famous 
Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, most, <laughs> most of the cool people I know are not famous. Yeah. And some of my favorite people to talk to are not famous. And some of them, unfortunately, I've made famous. But uh, <laughs> it's fucking weird for them, man. It's some. It, I've had some weird moments where I've, I, I had this unknown person on the show, and then I have them on, then I'll get a text message that just says, holy fuck, my whole life just changed. Like, this is nuts, man. My phone won't stop ringing. I'm getting emails from people I went to high school with. Like, this is nuts, man. And it's, it's just very strange for them. But the reach is crazy. You know, I think... I'm sitting around one day and I, I'm not like a big media guy. I mean, I, I listen to your podcast, it's about the only podcast I really listen to. I've never even listened to our own. And I'm hanging out one day and my phone's just blowing the fuck up, man. I'm getting like text, text after text after text. Like, dude, fucking so badass. How sick is that? Fucking roadster shop, you know, exclamation. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Well, you wore a Roadster Shop t-shirt one day on, a, on the podcast, dude. My fucking phone. Like, people I don't even know. I'm like, how'd you get my number? Who are you? Who Who is this? Everybody. Yeah. So fucking cool, That's man. Wild. So badass. Number one in 96 yeah. motherfucking countries. Right. There's no, there's no, <laughs> yeah, no yeah. surprise. Like, right, no <laughs> surprise, but it's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty crazy. Pretty fucking cool. Did what, you ever have any concerns <laughs> when you were getting the whole thing started with uh, the content and the structure? Because, like, on paper, in, like, today's politically correct world, like, it doesn't seem like it would work with well i'm a comic you know <laughs> so like comics are always talking about shit that's politically incorrect and we always in the beginning days it was all just comics and we would just get together and get high and just talk shit like but that's what we would do anyway and i was like why don't i like film this and you know i'd always done radio shows like i did opie and anthony a bunch of times and i really loved that doing that because you'd get together and it would be a bunch of comedians on and we would just talk shit and have fun laugh and and I was like, maybe I should figure out a way to do that for my house. And then we just initially started doing it with just a, a webcam on a laptop. And that was the early days of it. And there was no aspirations. There was no like, one day this is going to be huge. There was zero, absolutely zero. It was just for fun. And it, what's really funny is my friend Tom Segura, who has one of the biggest podcasts in the world too, he did my podcast in the early day, and he said to my friend Brian Redband, who I did the show with, he uh, after uh, he left, he's like, what is he doing? Like, why is he wasting his time doing this? Like, why does he spend hours in uh, fucking doing these things? And Redband was like, I don't know, that's just him. And, and he, now he's got a huge podcast, and I talked him into doing it. I remember a couple of years into me doing it, I was like, hey, bro, you and your wife should do a podcast. You guys are fucking hilarious together. And now their podcast is gigantic. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just one of those things. It's like nobody planned it. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody thought that podcasts would take off. I remember Howard Stern used to like constantly shit on podcasts. Like, what a waste of time. Bunch of fucking losers. And like, what are you doing? And I, I remember thinking that. Like, like, I wonder why he thinks like that. That's funny. Like, why would you give a shit? But he gave a shit because he's, he's a smart guy. Saw it and coming. he's threatened. And he right. saw it coming. He saw this fucking wave. You know, and when you're on satellite radio, the only way to get it is if you got satellite radio. But when you have the internet, man, it's just it's everywhere. There. It's everywhere. Uh, what cars do you still want to build? What's left out there? I don't know. Um, I think maybe a 69 Mustang. I'm thinking maybe a, maybe a 69 Mustang. I'm, I'm thinking about that lately. I'm really interested in those. But other than that, I have a lot of cars right now. I just got a Ford GT. I got a oh, 2006 nice. Ford GT with 500 miles on it. That's, oh. a, that's a sick car. Woo, that car's wild. That car's wild. Yeah, buddy of mine's got one. I was just fortunate to get some seat time in it. It's fucking unreal, man. It's It's got that analog feel, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't have to tell you. You yeah. fucking got one. I don't have one. No, He's it's, got it's one. glorious. <laughs> got one. You don't have one. Sick fucking that car. That car's glorious. Yeah. It's, a, it's a fun fucking car. Ford nailed it with that one. Woo. Yeah, they did. Favorite. It just drives me nuts that they don't make those top end cars anymore with manual transmissions. Like, yeah. I get it. All this zero to 60 <clears throat> shit and yeah. never green times. Like, okay. But it's, it's not as fun, stupid. Like, <laughs> Porsche is <laughs> yeah. the only people that have figured it out. Like, Porsche still makes manual transmissions for the GT3 and, you know, the GT3 Touring. Yeah. And, you know, they, they still do it. And Mustang still does it with everything other than the GT500. 
you know, you can still get a manual transmission, the GT350 and the new ones that are coming out, you know, the Dark Horse. I, you know, just, it's, that's what's fun, man. Yeah. Best piece of advice you've ever received? I don't think I've ever received a best piece of advice. I think it's an accumulation of pieces of advice. It's oh. like a constant accumulation. There's not one thing that anybody ever said to me that made sense that like, okay, this is it. This is the life changer. It's take, yeah. Taking it all yeah. in. Take it all in. and Yeah, everybody wants a magic it. pill. Yeah. You know, even with advice, you want this magic right? pill. <laughs> It's a grind, kids. Yeah. That's the best piece of advice. Yeah, that's it. Embrace the grind. Fucking get out there when you don't want to get out there. Get up when you don't want to get up. Push when you don't want to push. When you want to take a nap, get up and go. Just go. You got to go. And you got to force your mind. You got to steal your mind to do that. And if you do that, you'll be successful and you'll be happy. And if you don't do that, you're going to be miserable and you're going to have these feelings like you could have done more. That's the worst feeling in the world. The feeling of unrealized expectations, the feeling of like you could have done something and you didn't. And now you have to sit with your failure. And I don't like that. And I've felt, I've felt that before and I've learned from that terrible feeling. And so now I know that the terrible feeling that you feel when you don't want to do something, you have to force yourself to do it. That's, that's a good feeling. That feeling is good. You got to embrace that feeling. You got to embrace it and, and you got to tell your body like, nah, bitch, I'm in control of this yeah, motherfucker. Fuck you. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. And you, you got to, you got to like condition yourself to that. Like that has to be like a thing. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy life. I, I enjoy life. I enjoy, you know, having a few drinks with my friends. I enjoy going out to dinner. I enjoy hanging out with my family. I enjoy all those things, but there's a lot of shit that I do that I don't enjoy. And I enjoy that I do those things. That's what I enjoy. I enjoy the fruits of that labor. I enjoy the, I, I enjoy the results of the grind. Yeah, that's cool. That's, that's the best it advice is. we've heard on here. It's the goat, man. He's fuck. Yeah. It's in the, it's the mental part of it for sure. Like physically you can push yourself through things that are, they're tiring to do. They're hard. It's heavy. It fucking, it's stressful. This sucks. The mental aspect of it, that's when... Your, your body can take way more than right. what your mind will let you... Being in control of that. Joe, yeah, your that. mind's a little bitch. Yeah. <laughs> I know, man. You gotta your, mind, your mind wants to take naps. Right. Me, me, but you have, like, two different things in your mind. You got the mind... You got this mind, the part of your mind when everything's great and, and you're doing something great and you're, you're excited and you're inspired and... You got to find that part of your mind all the time. Go find that motherfucker. He's in there. Just grab him. And you got to wade through all the lethargic feelings and all the, you know, all the hesitation and all the procrastination. You got to just wade through that like a shark, just cut through the water and get to that part of your mind that gets excited. And that part of my mind, I cultivate that part of my mind. I get that motherfucker tight. I fire it up every day. I change the oil. I, you know, it's, but a part of that is also is keeping care, taking care of your body. You, you know, everybody wants to think that the mind and the body are two different things, but they're not. The better you feel physically, the better your mind works and the more you can squeeze out of your mind. And I see that with a lot of my friends that don't exercise and they drink all the time and smoke. They get older and then they don't have energy anymore. Their energy is like, it's like, like you'll watch their old comedy and then you watch their new comedy and the new comedy is like, they don't have as much juice. There's not as much because they're fading because they didn't take care of their machine. You know, it's all together and you know, the mind and the body and your, your mindset, they're all together and you got to, you've got to actively cultivate them and you've got to actively like encourage those powerful, positive thoughts. I know you got to go, man. Have fun at your show. Hope to see you soon here yep. in, uh, you know, next month or so. I think you're going to enjoy the, uh, CUDA. Yep. We'll be seeing you next with a silver shiny 70 CUDA. Well, I can't wait. I'm excited. <laughs> and I appreciate everything you guys do, man. You guys are fucking awesome. Hey. I'm, I'm glad you're out there. We can't, you. Thank, can't thank you enough for everything. And especially for coming on, man, it really means a lot. Appreciate it. Appreciate My the pleasure. opportunity, Thank man. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. I appreciate it, too. Take care, guys. Thank, Thank you. Man. Remember, you can keep up with Joe. I'm sure that everybody... Where, already, would, you know where, where would you find him? Uh, it's at Joe Rogan Yeah, hmm. on Instagram. All right. Yeah.
you, if you're not one of the 16.9 million followers as of this morning, <laughs> then maybe if he's going to pick up two, yeah. maybe three the, followers. Yeah, for the one produced. or two people who don't currently <laughs> hey, follow him that are listening hey, to this. Hey, get out there and let's move that needle. Yeah. We want Joe to be like, holy <laughs> shit. Uh, <laughs> next up, we've got a very special edition of Roach to Shop Hall of Fame. Yeah. We do. Yeah, we do. What do we have, guys? Uh, we got Take like the listeners uh, through. So it's almost, like, I guess I'd call it like a future Hall of Famer. You think? It's. It's made its way into the Hall of Fame in my... A living legend. Yeah, in my opinion. Um, we've got our... Uh, well, let's start with our very first production legend mm. truck, the Orange Blossom Special, which is 76? No, sorry. Orange Blossom, 73. Yep. Right? 73 uh, square body. And uh, that was our very first production vehicle, production truck. We had the prototype out uh, years before that. That's what uh, I've been driving for in three years, loving it, absolutely enjoying every minute of it. And this truck is the refinement. It's the finished product. It has all the cool shit in it, the things that we worked tirelessly for years to. I, that picture just kind of encapsulates everything we were going for all in one shot right there, I think. Yeah, that's it. Just, I mean, I, I, I've said it. I can't tell you how many times I've said it. It's the greatest thing. To drive and own. That's the 400th that, that time you said it. I know. I, I said can it. I can tell you. <laughs> right. You guys are probably getting sick of you me. You have to actually it. drive it, though, to experience you, it. I, so that's, I, feel I was firsthand. pitching. I was pitching John on it, who ended up buying it at Barrett Jackson. Um, good customer of ours. He's like, I'm going there. I'm bidding on it. I want the truck. How, like, give me the rundown on it. I'm like, dude, it's like a. Like everybody has said, like, oh, we're building you something you can daily drive. It's like driving a new truck. This is like driving a new fucking truck. Like you, you forget what you're in. It's so smooth. It goes down the road. It's just so mild mannered, but it's so badass at the same time. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, no, that sounds good. It sounds good. We deliver it to him. He drives it. He calls. He's like, dude, it's like driving a fucking new truck. I'm like, yeah, no, that's what I've been telling you. Thing I said. (laughs) He's like, no, like you said it, but until I drove it, like it's like driving a new fucking truck. It's, but it's funny, it's got that perfect blend. It still retains some of that analog feel. Like, we just got done talking to Rogan, which is what clearly he's after, yeah. you know, with the muscle car feel. But it's it, it's such a good blend of it to where you, you really want to drive it every day and just use the thing constantly. And this truck, it, it almost kind of pisses me off because mine doesn't have all the cool stuff in it. Right. These are all the parts that we kind of developed. And then this one, uh, I didn't get a, a ton of seat time in it and off it went but uh great customers got it and he's loving it but that that steering wheel and i mean back up there josh that's one of the coolest things in that truck that's something that chris worked uh kind of worked his ass off on and really knocked that out of the park it's uh it kind of did that in conjunction with uh lacara low car and it's a uh, leather wrapped uh 14 inch uh od wheel but the whole center is 3D printed to clamshell together to look just like that factory square body wheel, which that's such an iconic wheel, you can't change it, right? But you want the right steering ratio, you want the right feel, you want the right grip thickness on the steering wheel. That's something that's overlooked is the diameter and that leather yeah. wrap yeah. ring of the, of the wheel. The one thing I do miss is the hot, uh, sticky, soft touch material that comes off all over your head. Just pour some honey shit. on it and it'll be fine. Well, fortunately... <laughs> You still have that in your yeah, truck. It's in my so, truck. Yeah, Phil's got one of those. Cold days, it's great. Anything yeah. over 70 <laughs> degrees, and you're just going like this for like an hour after you uh, drive. Something about that old plastic yeah. that just like sweats Get out Get the of driving there. gloves out of the Miata, though, and just use oh, them in the yeah, C10. That's not a bad right. idea. <laughs> yeah. But it, it just one of those little touches that they're all throughout the truck that really makes it feel just awesome to drive. You don't have the heavy weight of a billet wheel that you do kind of that negatively affects oftentimes a big chunk of billet negatively affects the steering feel but uh man I, I don't know it's like i can't say enough awesome things about it i hate to sound like i'm i'm bragging it's not that it's from like a fit finish and it's not like we did something that gm didn't already do there it's just the functionality the engineering uh the amount of work that mike put into that is just well take I everybody mean, through i mean now we've done unreal. some videos and stuff like that why does it drive like a new truck because what's underneath it's essentially a new truck, plus some of the a lot of refinement on top of that refinements and upgrades that you'd want to do to that new truck to make it just a little bit better. So um, it's a chassis that uh, we engineered here in house, um, and it accepts all 
OEM general orders components. So it's bolt on IFS, all off the shelf stuff straight from GM. So GM disc brakes, um, you know, it's a floating caliper. Uh, they just work phenomenally well. And every single component in that front end and kind of the best novelty of it is that you've got number one, you got rack and pinion steering. Number two, you've got a front diff. That's again, another GM part that is push button four wheel drive on the fly. So you can use it when you want to use it. You know, if it's most people aren't taking these things, using them in the mud, but if you're sliding around in your driveway, when it snows here in the Midwest, you click that thing in four wheel and, and that makes it e- easier for her to slide over and ride in the middle because you don't have to straddle <laughs> yeah. that stick either. It absolutely yeah. does. Yeah, and you don't want to take your arm off her and get out and you know, right. lock, lock the hubs. The hubs. Right. Yeah. So you yeah. just reach over with the other arm and click her in the four wheel. But I brought this up with Joe when we were talking about like when you think you've mastered something, like do you just give up on it or do you kind of keep going back into different areas and refine things? And I think this is kind of our version of that. That yeah. I don't want to say we've mastered anything beforehand, but we got – a lot of the style and design stuff down and now on this we spent a insane amount of time going back and hitting things that we had drastically overlooked for years on the ride quality the performance the longevity the the durability and making something that could be a, a daily driver and rehoning skills on on that let's apply in everything we've learned really it's right now i think it's the best it, it represents where we're at right now it's a culmination of culmination there you go hit it josh culmination culmination okay (laughs) of everything we've learned over the years and we've applied it to that so yeah but that's the next thing will be better than that's just a broad statement that's just saying saying things so you got to explain that there is in in a not in in a bad way down to the finishes on the bolts yeah for a reason sure because of wanting to drive it year round or daily drive it or taking it to a place in Detroit, an OEM level facility and putting it in a soundproof room and putting speakers and microphones everywhere to I just chase harmonics. Exactly. And, I just, I just right, want to take the time to explain that this is not just, you not know just what, saying things. we can build a frame that has pickup right. points to accept sure. OEM suspension. That's, I think that's what people get. They yeah. understand that part, but that's a very, that's, that's right. a minimal part. Our next level will be refining how we actually sell it and do the sales. Yeah, exactly. We got it. We got to get better at that part of it. But they're, you know, taking through some of those details, like you said, you got, you carry the front suspension, you know, push button, four wheel drive, all that's great. All right. What about the back? So the back is, believe it or not, that is something that's, I hate to use the word primitive, but it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward, pretty, it's not over the top. We stuck with a pretty standard leaf spring setup in it, but we work with Deaver's Leafs to do a progressive multi-leaf spring and we just found that for that particular application, if ride quality was the number one focus and pairing that with some Fox shocks seemed to accomplish that the best. And then a for, lot of drivability and revalving, retuning, playing with spring rates to get it yep, perfect right. for that truck. For the be- the perfect for that truck for the majority, I'm saying 99% of the driving that these customers will do in this truck. There is all different types of suspension, front and rear designs, straight axle, four length, five length. We do them all. You, we do all that kind of stuff. And for the most part, that, that shit's fucking awesome. However, for the most part, it is over-engineered and built to look a certain way because it's designed to do things that those customers generally aren't doing with their vehicles. So then you suffer some from the ride quality because you're not rock crawling or you're not going, you know, doing it, utilizing that suspension for its intended design. So this was a complete train and thought change of yep. a guy that's buying a brand new Silverado is not rock crawling and is not jumping and is not doing those things. Right. And they, they've been using Lee Springs for a long time for a certain reason. Right. So, and we have a very small product offering, I guess, if you will, it's only going for these trucks. Exactly. So we don't have to try to have 47 different leaf springs and right. you can, you can refine it for one specific model significantly better. And, and then, and a fucking spare tire. Yeah. Well, integrate into it, it's all the stuff that you need. It's got a hitch on it. It's got a helper bag system. So if you're throwing dirt bikes in the back, you're pulling a small trailer, um, you can retain the smooth ride quality of those leafs without having some like aggressive, harsh helper spring. And you can account for, the added load by pumping up the trailering bags on it 
you got a spare tire. So if you're cruising that thing, you drive it all over, use it like a new car, get a flat, boom. Spare what about tire. gas tank? Gas tanks, OE, one. plastic. Does, we see it. Yeah, <laughs> plastic OE, uh, Chevrolet gas tank, modified fuel pump in it. That's, again, it's it's an OE part, but it's CTSV internals, so it handles the power of the LT4. It has the fuel delivery for that. But but what do you do about it if you want to hear the that. Brrrr. Yeah, then you then you can go get yourself like a uh, good old fashioned go to a swap meet get a holly blue, blue pump, pump. <laughs> with frame rail, rail. Frame rail. Yeah, yeah, just wire it up you don't even have to don't isolate it, it either yeah. not that thing straight to the frame rail Couple so you can tappers. feel that resonance yeah <laughs> um but uses a factory cat uh system up in the front factory mm-hmm. manifolds all stainless steel from their back on the bore of the muffler it's a one in two out just like you'd see on a new truck so it gives you the perfect the absolute perfect exhaust note where it is just a slight bit of muscle car, slight bit of performance, but it is, it's not going to ring your ears. It's, after it's civil. The guy who's buying this typically has an HOA. I'll just say that there's an HOA where he's driving through and, yeah, and he would, you know, yeah. <laughs> we're on the uh, ranch. You don't want to, you don't want to scare what's the, the black, what's the black can hit hanging over. I think that's something that's often overlooked. It's just, you know, said, yeah. explained, Oh, that's the charcoal can. Well, we but, put that on there for the wives. So, when you park that in the garage, that EVAP system, it ties into the ECU, has a solenoid on the motor side, so it vacuums, it's constantly pulling a vacuum on the fuel venting system so you don't get that muscle car fuel scent in your garage that stinks up the entire garage and stinks up you mm-hmm. while you're driving the car. Again, just something you take for granted that's on virtually every new vehicle and has been for, I don't know, 15 plus years, but... Uh, yeah, it just kind of shows the level of detail that's gone into it just to make the thing, the functionality. Factory cats, yep. factory down white pipe. Yeah, and they're LT1 for how much horses on the LT1? LT1s are 450 horse. 450 and 650 mm-hmm. on the supercharged LT4. What What is your take on LT1 versus LT4? For this truck, you've got an LT4 right. in your truck. I like the LT4 because I can't tell you how many people's days I've ruined <laughs> at leaving a stoplight <laughs> in that thing. And it's the LT4 is so civilized at idle that it, there's nothing about it that makes you think this isn't drivable. This is too much power, right? So it's just you need to be like as responsible as I am with it as to how hard you press on the Especially in accelerator. The yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, and around, I, and around sweeping corners. Yeah, it's, it's, it'll step out on you. <laughs> uh, before we go too far, explain the uh, steering system. Well, you talked about the rack. Yeah. But hook up to the column. That's mm-hmm. something that has done has been done the same way for a long time. It has. Um, but why do the OEs do what they do? Well, they do what they do because you want to. That's the that's the one thing that connects you to the ground. So, steering wheel. You know, there's a number of different things that are connected to things that they're connected to that are then touch the ground. So if you're going to feel something, feel some sort of NVH harmonic any input in the wheel, in the truck, it's going to more than likely come from the steering. So it's, a again, an OE uh, GM hydraulic steering rack, super isolated, huge rubber bushings, um, uses the GM factory uh, U-joint connection, which is also isolated. Um, collapsible shaft within it uh, uses our bolt down. We've got a cool little adapter that's a, a little piece of chromoly that connects right to the factory steering location. I think that's some of the the unsung hero in some of the chassis platform of what what that does to the driving experience. Yeah, it feels, but well, you don't feel anything. That's right. what's good about it. Exactly, <laughs> you don't feel it. Yeah. You don't know it's there. But yeah, just all those things add up to just an absolute pleasurable driving vehicle. Can't say it enough. And just look at it, you know, with your eyes. It's fucking it's cool. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, just the engineering level of just that. Yeah. Like, it's unseen. That really is. In our industry and yeah. it's legitimately OEM level sure. stuff to well, 3D scan an entire truck, design every system in SolidWorks and have it all worked out on a computer. It's and five, five, five fucking years. Yep. Five fucking years, and then also utilizing stuff that's had billions of dollars of engineering in it. Right. You and know. then we took it one step further. Right. But even everything, you know, you, the 
the wheels on it. That's a, uh, at a glance, it looks like a simple hubcap steel wheel, but we work with built specialties on those, and that is a one-off wheel for the Legend series, so 17-inch. Um, work with them on the ID of the barrel to get the smallest OD wheel that we can package around that factory brake so we can retain the classic look, big sidewall, um, also get that, you know, kind of soft, plush ride out of having the large sidewall on it. Um, but it work, just looks so much better. Oh, it looks great. People yeah. fuck it up so many times with just by going to yeah. an 18. <clears throat> and it, a soft lip. It's, and, yeah. it's funny how that, that inch, I mean, you know, I don't have to tell you, you know, what you, <laughs> yeah. it's not often you work that hard to lose an inch, you know? It's but, the only time. Right. It's the only time. <laughs> Those wheels are available in two color options, right? They are. Yeah, we've got the box white, which typically matches almost every one of the white two-tones. And then we do kind of a two-tone that's uh, a polished hoop with a satin charcoal center. That te- tends to work well with the trucks that have a lot of trim. It really it's works a little good. a higher-end option version. Yeah. And, we, and we ran through multiple sets of tires on these just trying to find whatever tracks the best. Uh, what's the smoothest on the road? What makes the least noise? The least noise is probably the biggest one. Yep. You hear some of those coming down the road, and you're wah, like How's ten minutes before. How's we we got to get, get Fuller back fuller here. Let him <laughs> get in the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we'll yeah, just the amount of detail you spent in every area of the truck to yeah, then put a original paint stock body on it and right. have something that blows you away. Just some more of those details. Yeah. So why, that, the, why does this exist? So that exists partially out of necessity, but that's a perfect blend of uh, function and form, form and function. The fuel tank on these trucks, since we're using an OEGM piece, it lands on the driver's side, which is also nice because most modern cars, the convenience of filling the car on the driver's side, it's nice, right? But these trucks, they were typically a passenger side fill. When they had dual tanks, saddle tanks, they're on both sides. So what we did is create a cap that uh, gives you the feel. Um, you know, that era, nothing's cooler than, like, a Cobra cap or a Mopar. Mop- yeah, any of the Mopar stuff. There was just something always really bitching about that. So this allowed us to make that fuel filler connection without disrupting the factory patina of these trucks because we're typically doing original paint trucks that you yeah. don't want to disrupt. No weld, no paint. Yeah. Hold on. So it's one simple hole. That's a multi-piece billet component that just feels awesome. You don't want to sit there and flick it open and closed all day long. Um, it looks like it should have come <laughs> on the truck. Yeah. Oh, it have 100%. What, for those that I know they're going to ask, yep. what do you do with the factory fill cap? You'd leave it there. Mm-hmm. Fuck it. Yep. <laughs> you know? Right. All kinds of cool things you could put behind there. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, Rabbit's they differ. Foot. So the early yeah. trucks, yeah, the early trucks, it was like just a traditional vented cap. Mm. You get into, I don't, I forget the cutoff year, if it's 75, 76, where they went to an actual fuel door. Um, Yezzy is sending an email right now on what the specific Yeah, somebody's going to fact check me on that. <laughs> do you know why that the I'm sure you do. gas fill was on the passenger side of that air truck? Enlighten us, Josh. Back then women were more submissive and they would fill the tank for you. Are you serious? Yeah, you could get you could just stay in the truck. You fucking made, your phone. That made that up. <laughs> You're just saying that because Back you then, still you make stay your, in the truck and play on the yeah, phone. <laughs> you still make your wife do that. Fill my truck? No, cuz modern trucks are on the driver's side. Uh, only American built So you vehicles. make her walk you make her walk around. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can check on her. Yeah. Well, you good out there, honey? <laughs> no, it's cold. All foreign vehicles when you drive on the right side of the road? The fill is on the passenger side when they're American cars. Really? Yeah. Hmm. It's a true story. Put that in your little fucking bank of knowledge. I, I like my answer better. Uh, <laughs> so we've talked about <clears throat> the reasoning. We've talked about the engineering and technology that's gone in. We've talked about the prototype truck. We are also building more of these trucks. Trucks? We are. We have some of them whole mess here of them going to look right at now. Yeah, we'll have uh, this summer, we should have seven or eight of them out on the road. Um, got some great trucks really awesome time capsules some pretty rare finds for some awesome customers uh the majority of them are crossing the finish line as we speak and we also have one that's uh you know a little higher end unit that you know call it your king ranch call it whatever it's uh uh it's a ford thing yeah it's a denali then yeah the denali whatever you want to call it it doesn't have a name but it's just 
fit and finish is nice, painted, full custom interior. Uh, our focus has really been on uh, on the survivor type trucks. A lot, yeah. lot more enjoyable to own and use. And they are all going to have a cool name. They are. So Numero Uno is named Orange Blossom Special. Yep. And there's the prototype. They're getting after it in the mud. So if you do want to put it in the mud, it, it will do. do it. It'll do off road things. I feel like those need to be posters. That's a good picture. Awesome pictures. That, the truck is still filthy. Yeah, I opened the, oh, the other day. It's fucked. Yeah. It's destroyed. <laughs> it's absolutely destroyed. There's there's no other LT4 in existence that looks <laughs> as shitty as that one right now. It's uh, it's got some mud on it, yeah, but it's meant to keep taking yeah. it. Yeah. But so, yeah, home we're selling them, and we've got them. Um, we've got a pretty good collection. We've acquired uh, quite a few trucks over the years. Um, some stuff that we know will make awesome conversions and uh yeah if you're looking for something that's what a, if a guy says i want one of these trucks yeah i've got a 77 c10 short box yeah i want i want to build it we will take it that's how matt's came about yeah there's a little bit of a vetting process in there to see what the truck is and if well it, sure yeah yeah if it's cool and yeah. it's clean yes absolutely it's not just any truck right. it's got to be got to be the right truck um and they can call us up. Those are going to run, depending on the motor that they pick and the condition of your truck, which we're only going to take it if it's in good enough condition to build. But what is, the, what is that going to run? If a guy calls in tomorrow and says, I got to have one of those. Trucks are going to be in the 250 to 300 range, and it's going to depend on what motor you choose. And then really the only option, which isn't really an option, is kind of what you're going to do on the interior. So sure. a lot of the ones we've had have been just killer, original, untouched trucks yeah. that we didn't mess with the interior. Those alligator inserts, that's going to step you up. In we're not gonna, we're that, not that's going to step you right out of this shop and somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> that's, where that's, that's what that's going to do. <laughs> Stingray? <laughs> that will get you there, too. Ostrich. Yeah. yeah, all the above. All the exotic animal hides. <laughs> They're not going to not gonna happen here. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how they go. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So... Definitely higher price point, not for everybody. We talked about that in some of the video stuff that we've done. You get a lot of guys screaming about, you know, where the price is. Cost what it costs. Make no excuses. Yep. A lot of labor, a lot of time, a lot of engineering, a lot of expensive parts go into them. Um, limited quantities that we can actually build. On the flip side, we do offer the the complete chassis for them through the, the chassis shop side where you can buy a rolling chassis, motor, trans, exhaust system, Cooling stack, fuel system, kind of everything to then just drop your body right on top and start the build from there and yeah. do whatever you want to the exterior, the interior, customize it however you want. We're kind of killing the uh, the guesswork and, you know, making all the mechanical features. There, yeah, there is no, no guesswork. It's all there for you, yeah. engineered package, ready to roll. Well, it's working out great for some shops, too. I know uh, Devlin Customs, they've got a couple on order. So he's going to be putting together some trucks. And uh, like I always say, man, super interested in seeing what guys like him do with them. We've got, uh, you know, an existing customer of ours. We've done a number of cars for uh, the Freemals. They're getting one, and they're going to legitimately use it as a farm truck. It's going to get a stake bed, flat bed, and use it out on their farm. I kind of want one of those. Full, full package optioned all the way up um, with all of the things. That's what, 129, 130, something like that? Again, depending on the motor and what yeah. you do, but yeah. 90 to 120 range. Um, another pretty good option for these things. Um, you know, we're doing the Premier Street Rides, came out with that brand new early Blazer uh, body. Um, first chassis for the early Blazers going to them to build a truck on, but the early Blazers have gone through the roof, um, kind of kicking the Broncos' ass right now. Um, so they're doing the reproduction bodies, buy the body, drop the body on, and you've got a brand new. 69 to 72 blazer um hell of a platform sweet it's awesome jump on the website check them out we got a ton of videos jump on our youtube page and look up legend series there's some really really good action shots some good overviews we've probably crammed more information than you want to hear down your throat tonight but there's more of it you can get it on youtube there's a lot to talk about there it is. it's hard to just kind of trickle it out there right. Legend yeah. series. Available now. 
No Roadster show. You didn't need any add-ons. It was fine like it was. We could edit that out. They, but they <laughs> won't, though. That's the thing. Mm. It'll live on forever. I wonder if they, they're going to edit me kicking the fucking crap out of you. <laughs> out. They could edit that part out. Maybe they could never edit out you sounding stupid right there. But I mean, so <laughs> that lives on forever. <laughs> that's we, chiseled in stone. Yeah, huh? that's, that's, okay. We did have more listener questions we were going to do. One of them was another. Are we going to fight? I think we need to start taking a tally. Because we're going to fight, right? That's, that's going to happen. I'd like to take the tally to Who start seeing. Yeah, we win? start playing some, some wagers. If it's going to go down, I'm not doing it for free. I'm an opportunist, all right? <laughs> like, Thanks we, get, for the, we get Rogan on to announce it to a pay-per-view event. Yeah. I mean, I'm down. Before you uh, oh, end this. It's we, time. We, yeah, it's we gotta, time for a whiskey review. Yeah, we'll keep you a little longer. This is we, a got, special, we got a special one. Special whiskey review. Special guest, special whiskey. We uh, had to break out the big guns for the big guns. Yeah, we went top shelf tonight and cracked up in a uh, bottle of Pappy Van Winkle. How do you it's pronounce that? Pappy Van Winkle. 15-year mm. family silent, reserve. Silent W, I see. <sighs> Winkle. Winkle. It is uh, 107 proof, probably one of the more sought-after bourbons. We're going to get some shit on this one because... No, I'm... Because you're going to mix it with Coke? No. no. Uh, because people say, you know, say, hey, that's great. You're drinking some of that stuff. Review some of the more obtainable we ones. Did. And we, we, we did. We did. This is so those, not obtainable yeah, at those all. Those people, they can shut the fuck up for a little while now. <laughs> okay? <laughs> because it's been now like six episodes of drinking. Yeah, we've been doing some obtainable. Right. Short of obtainable. drinking Jack Daniels, we've had all the stuff you can go grab at your local liquor store, especially at Garfield's Beverage Warehouse and, and Liquor Emporium. Yep. You can get it all there, but tonight we got something special. We're lucky because we do have Garfield's Beverage Warehouse and Liquor Emporium, and he loves what we've done. Honestly, we've changed his business we, with <laughs> with the new name and yeah. the whole new outlook and stuff. We're, so we're lucky enough that he's been <laughs> able to provide us with something that is this special for such a special guest. Right. So we promise we'll get back to some... Average stuff. Obtainables. But yeah. that's enough excuses about it. you got to flex every it's, once in a while. Well, what do you, you think? I mean, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not bad, right? see what all the yeah. hype's about. Yeah. No, it, instantly. Fortunately and unfortunately, this has been a very busy week for us. We have done a shit ton of podcasts. I don't know if you know this or not. When we do podcasts, we drink. And we've Old been bad. drinking a lot. A lot. Like a a lot. lot. A lot this week, and we've drank a lot of different things. That's good and bad. Um, the good thing is because it's so fresh on palate wise, and we've had so many things instantly. When I tasted this, it, the first thing was like, "Holy shit!" The flavor, not in a bad way, not anything yeah. like that. It was just so, without sounding too weird, it was. I want to hear this. Yeah, he's going to say something stupid. Go no, ahead. It was. It <laughs> Wait, was. Shh, let him. Let him. Shh. It was detailed. The flavor was detailed. It was very nuanced with different flavors. It wasn't just, oh, this is spicy. Oh, this is fruity. It was very detailed in the flavor. It sounds a little and, fruity. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what was fruity <laughs> is you giving that review. I see. That was fruity. Anyway, detail the details. It for was us, good. Please. I liked it. Okay, I'm with you though. Immediately when you taste it, you know. You could blind taste test that one, and you know that that's something special. Yeah. It's got a shit ton of flavor immediately. It's also got a decent amount of burn. It's 107 proof, so it... Uh, I was going the other way. I didn't get as much really? burn for being that kind of high proof. I get a little and chest burn, and it I did sticks not with get me. chest burn. I got a little bit of mouth burn. Hmm. Let you know there's not, a little no bad something there. Not complaining. No, it's, not at all. The, simply put, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, having had all of the... Pappy Van Winkle's solid flex. Yeah, a little bit of flex. Kind uh, of a big deal. Well, uh, I've drank them all. <laughs> ha having had them all, it ranks up there at the top, but but it falls short of the lot B12 here, in my opinion. Agreed. From a drinker, it's it's great, and it's one of the best we've drank, so I'm not discrediting it. I just like the 12 year a little bit better. And I like the 20 year a little bit better than that. So that's kind of like not at in the bottom, the not at the top, but it, it's a great in the Van Winkle family. You like the 20 year better than this? I do. I like, so 12, 
20, 15, 10. And then the family reserve rise kind of, it's that one. It's kind of out there on its own. It's really good. You would absolutely sell this one at secondary to buy two lot B's on a deal. Yes. hundred percent. Probably would have been a good thing to point out before we opened it. No, I still love it though. It's great. (laughs) It's just, you know, you can, you you gotta have a variety. It's fucking awesome. Um, uh, we were talking to some guys earlier, and it is, <clears throat> it is, ob- obtainable for a poor every now and then at the right restaurants, and it very. No, dude, if, you're, if you're a poor, you cannot get. It's expensive. <laughs> it's <laughs> for, to get a pour of it, right? If you want to taste, <laughs> fuck, you, we are coming I, across as assholes. I didn't know. At what, least you two I, are. Yeah. Uh, you you can find a pour of it sometimes. Okay. At different restaurants, it does yes. it does vary wildly in price depending on the market that you're in and stuff. So larger cities, nicer restaurant. Look at it, look at it, and see. You, I have seen this now for forty bucks for a pour before, forty to fifty bucks for a pour. Sure, um, it's probably worth trying it if you've never had it yes. for that. But I've also seen it for one hundred and fifty to two hundred, three hundred dollars for a pour. Don't, don't try it for and that. Do not do that. Now. Right. Yeah. There's hype for a reason. I think it definitely lives up to the hype. It's not a life changer that some people make it out to be. They've never had it. Any of the pappy stuff, it's not going to, like, blow your socks off. 12-year will. That'll blow your shoes and your (laughs) socks off. 12-year absolutely will. But having drank as much as we've drank and all that, I will say, like, there's something to be said the very first time. If if you can splurge and do something and, and find a bottle and pay secondary... Do it for the experience. However, after that, there's no need in doing that. If you only pay for it, if you've got a deal that you can get it at, you know, MSRP or whatever, which is going to be 150 bucks or 140 bucks or something like that. Other than that, it's fucking great. It absolutely lives up to the hype. But you can get damn fucking close. Yes. For a lot fucking cheaper and a lot yeah. easier. So don't, I don't want, like, guys that are getting into it out there thinking that for, they're never going to taste the goodness if they never taste that, it, it is fucking good. I'm not downplaying it whatsoever, but what's there's the, a lot of fucking good bourbons out there. What's the, the review? Five. What's the number? Yep. Hmm. I'm hesitant to put a number on it. Yeah, I, I feel know. like I, I need. I feel like I need to be a little more calculated right. on it. Give me last seasons it's reviews just so I could get a. I feel like I know where I, I want to hit it, but I know where I'm going. Hancock's Reserve was 838683. I mean, you could find that anywhere, though. Um, I think I'm going 87. We haven't done the 12 year, have we? No. I don't think. Okay. Where was the birthday bourbon at? Okay. Or did we forget to reserve? I think you're, uh, I think you're, you're pretty accurate there. It's a pretty good review. You gonna stick with that? I am. Okay. I'm gonna take that just a little north of there, and I'm gonna go with the eight nine because it's up hmm. there. And it, it, the Old Forester birthday, my review on that at a nine one helped me put that in perspective. Uh, what did I give the birthday? Uh, nine four. Uh, yeah, you're a I birthday nine, fan. Three. I'm a birthday fan. Yeah, I it's love my the favorite birthday. by far. Yeah. I'm gonna go nine zero. Oh. Nine zero, eight nine, and eight seven. It's, it's. I think we should just probably finish this up, sign off, and let's just, just kill this motherfucking bottle. I'm down. And never do a podcast again after it's be a pretty tough one to beat. <laughs> I mean, that's a, also a way to do. You, know, you got to go out on top. Go out. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the oil and whiskey with the Roadster Shop. <clears throat> that was fucked up. Hold Hit on. it again. Thanks for listening to Oil and Whiskey and Ironclad Original. If you like the show, be sure to leave a rating and review on the all-new Oil & Whiskey YouTube page. Thanks again to our guest, Joe Rogan. That still seems weird yeah. to say. We'll see you again next week.